Hello, you're listening to Otaku Spirit Anime Cast. My name is Andrew, and I'm joined here with Chris. Yo. Today's episode is our summer 2021 anime season reviews part two. We have a whole bunch of titles to go through, including Remake Our Life, How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom, The Eated and Deities No Only Peace, Drugstore Another World, The Slow Life, Nighthead 2041, The Dungeon of Black Company, Remain, Battle on the Game, and Five Seconds, Sunny Boy, My Next Life as a Villainous, All Routes Lead to Doom, X, Beastars, Second Season, My Hero Academia, Season 5, that time I got reincarnated as a slime, season two, part two, Higurashi Sutsu, Tokyo Revengers, and we'll do some, maybe some discussion about the great Jahi will not be defeated and the Aquatope of White Sand because those are both technically continuing on. But yes, it's a lot of titles to go through. I I think we're gonna have to go back to three parters again. <laughs> uh, I don't know. The last last season or uh, last uh, episode wasn't too long, so I guess that's fine. But yeah. A lot of great tiles to go through. There's a few here that I'm kind of not wanting to do reviews on. <laughs> so we'll we'll see how I can not uh, not get too negative. I don't know. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, yeah. Starting things off, we have Remake Our Life or Bokotachi No Remake. This one's streaming on Crunchyroll. Ran for 12 episodes. The studio is Feel. The source is a light novel. The uh, genres are comedy, sci-fi, drama. The director is Tomoki Kobayashi, who did A Kamiga Kill. Amagami SS++ 100, Seiden, and Utawara Mono. And the creator of this series is Nachi Koi, who did the script work for Fruit of Grisaya. So, interesting stuff there. But yeah, this one follows a guy named Koya. And Koya, as the story opens up, it's his current time, which he is an adult. He is currently working in the visual novel industry. The shoujo company that he's working for has recently gone under. And as he's going home, he's kind of... I guess reflecting on his life, how he made decisions that he kind of regrets. And he, at some point, apparently, when he was younger, had decisions between either going to a more of an art school or going to more business school. And he chose a business school and then eventually wanted to get into the industry that he loved so much, which was, you know, anime, visual novels and stuff. And, of course, the company that he worked for failed miserably. So coming back into... <laughs> His decision, he's, like, regretting it. He's talking about the Platinum Generation, which is this group of, like, really good creators that he's really in, into. Specifically, Akishino, who is this artist that does cre- uh, character designs that he really does enjoy. Actually, I think her name was, like, Shino Aki or something like that. But anyway, <laughs> you know, pin names and stuff. But um, at some point, he wakes up, and suddenly he is back in time. The same day that he actually acquired both of the acceptances of both colleges. And he decides, well... I'm back in time, I might as well, you know, do the decision that I kind of regret that I didn't do and go to art school. And so without even really questioning why he's there, <laughs> he just starts doing art school and getting into the same, pretty much the same class that the Platinum Generation was a part of and kind of hoping that he will kind of become a creator alongside those people that he looked up to so much. So, yeah. And then, of course, as as it, you would kind of guess, <laughs> he's in a dorm room with several other creators and the first one, he kind of realizes that, yeah, like I said earlier, this girl, his uh, his character artist that he looks up to so much, is actually in his dorm. It's Akishino, and she is, he kind of looks into her, I don't know, he's peeping into her room. I didn't realize how creepy that was. <laughs> he just looks into her room as she's working on something and goes, oh, it's it's the, the character artist that I look up to so much. I got to work hard and get, and get good at this stuff. So, yeah, it kind of follows him as he gets in the art school, and obviously... What he realized really quickly is um, Misaki Kano, which is their kind of their not really teacher. She's like a, uh, I don't know, like a superintendent or, pr- or principal or something kind of points it out that, you know, you know, you're all here because you want to get into art. Well, guess how many people that go here actually get into the industry that they want? And it was like something like f- eight people <laughs> of all the people there. So kind of points out this idea that even though he has chosen this, it's not going to be easy. It's actually going to be a more difficult route for him to take to actually get into the artist industry because as we all know there's uh, thousands of people that want to get into art or not thousands millions of people that want to get into art and not many of them actually make a living with it so yeah let's uh remake our life your thoughts i i'm at this is one that um andrew kind of shoved me to 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 finish up i'm i'm very happy of it uh he, this this show absolutely um, th- it, one of the cool things is noticing the the director and and the the different shows that he's covered or she's covered, and I really do love the fact that 
this is an, a perfect example of if you have a great um, source material, you can great, create a great anime. This, this, this story is absolutely well done as far as just um, the, the subjects that it's covering, the drama beats. I really, really love the fact that even though, yes, he's going back, it's not necessarily necessarily oh he's going to go through this entire thing and he's going to get the perfect uh, situation that he wants. Um, so I really do love that even though the de- he, uh, he's going back and redoing everything, his decisions are affecting these these characters. And I don't want to get too far into the the spoilery ter- territory here, but what he does in the past does affect things in the future. And the, and it shows that at, very well. Um, and plus, it doesn't necessarily mean the worst case scenario. So even though he does affect things, it's not all for bad. Some things are good. Some things are bad. It's, it's, it's an equal give and take of everything. And I really do love that they, they pointed those things out and, and made an effort to show it's not ev- everything that is sunshine and rainbows just because you got to retry, retry everything. Yeah, that was kind of the the because it let's let's just get it out of the way. Technically, the sad thing is when this show first came out, it obviously has some tropes in it that were the typical harem tropes, like the moment that he wakes up in the past. Well, not really the moment he wakes up in the past. The moment he like gets into school and everything. The, the next morning he wakes up and there's literally a cute girl sleeping next to him. And so it has like that feeling of a harem, but it never really plays off it because it's not that Koya is a ditherer or anything like that. He just really kind of focused on the dream that he has, which the dream is to be a part of Platinum Generation, to get into that industry and be successful in that industry. So it it's never like he's, you know, seeking out, I must find cute girls and oh my gosh, I got a harem around me. Uh, oh, oh my gosh, what are they doing with me? It's, it's really more of an adult story hitting st- strictly on both the concept of, yeah, doing the things that you kind of regret that you didn't do, which is definitely a heavy subject in it early on, is this idea of, you know, it's a wish fulfillment and the idea that you can redo your life. You can, you know, a lot of people have that mentality of, man, I wish I went to college, or I wish I did this instead of this. I wish I took this course. I wish I did this. I wish I got this job. It's that whole regret thing and going back and fixing it that is definitely hitting heavy on. But it's never really the focus to bag the girls. It's never really the focus to, you know, have a successful life. A lot of the focus is more on just focusing on the dream, which the dream for a majority of the show for him is the platinum generation. He That's what he's seeking. And so I do like the fact that, like you mentioned, it's not really, it's not really, you know, fantastical about it. Because seriously, a lot of the things that he does, does technically hinder those around him because he's working so hard to be a part of it. And the willingness to go into that aspect, I think, was end up being the core of the show later on. And it was a way that I, a route that I thought was really interesting, you know, really early on, like within the, I don't know, maybe the fourth episode or something like that. It's hits his on the idea where he's technically plagiarizing <laughs> because he has this subconscious knowledge of the future that he technically steals something. And that stealing of something you think really early on is like, wow, that that technically has stolen this guy's future. That's not really a good thing. That's really a, that's kind of a heavy subject. And it was those subjects that I was really interested in. It was those, those are those subjects that I actually was really interested in the series getting into. And it did a lot of that stuff. It gets into creativity. It gets into the, the aspects of taking your job seriously. It takes art in a seri- uh, in a serious tone. And all those elements were the things that I enjoyed. Yes. In the background, there is, oh my gosh, Akishino is cute. Which girl is he going to get with? But it was never the focus. And even Nanako's story was kind of a similar case. Really interesting to get into essentially the birth of a singer. Well, what does that kind of involve with? How involved does he get? And how does that affect the person in the future? So I I do like the idea of having a kind of a go back in time type of story where the positives that you can see possibly being there are actually negatives. The effects that you have on people's lives are stronger than you actually think of. Uh, yeah, I guess you can kind of chop it up to similar to a butterfly effect, but I don't think it's really necessarily that. It's more of an idea of just the consequences of your actions affecting those around you, even though you don't necessarily see that you're doing something negative. So it was really good. Yeah, it looks great. Visually, it looks great. Again, the characters are cute. 
Um, a lot of great characters. I, I think that's uh, one of its strongest points is that I just love all the characters. They were so fantastic. Um, Akishino, obviously, is very cute, very determined, uh, has her own insecurities. Uh, Nanako is very adorable. Um, just loved her story. I think she got, like, uh, she got, I think she got most of the character development in the entire show uh, very early on, though. Uh, Eiko Kawas uh, Kawasagawa is fantastic as well. I think she was the uh, surprise hit in the end. I, I think, uh, unfortunately, very underused, but in the end comes through. Uh, I like Suryuki. Um, he pretty much becomes a very core part of the later part. And, yeah, obviously best uh, president or whatever she was, Misaki. <laughs> Um, the, the only negative I really give the show is the ending was very, was a letdown, I think. I, I, and this is kind of one of those prime examples where I think the journey was more important than the ending, but it, it didn't really have a very satisfying ending. It didn't at all. It made me really, really desperately want more. So I, I really hope that we get a, some kind of a, uh, acknowledgement of another season. The best way that I can put it is it's, yeah, I don't even know if it's a, a, a it's, it's one of those things where, it feels like I can see this being the ending of the novel or whatever. Like, it does feel like you could technically write this up as, well, then they go on to the future. Like, you know, there there really isn't any kind of like, where, where's the stopping point have to be? It doesn't necessarily have to be further on. I can see the writer having this be the ending. Um, so I don't know necessarily that it feels like it's a source material bite. But at the same time, it has that feeling of like, I kind of I kind of don't feel the big boss was defeated. Like there is one character that technically is the big boss and that wasn't defeated. Like there is this big issue and it technically and it and it's the issue that technically was triggered some point in the show and it is like kind of the final boss and it was never technically addressed. So it's kind of like one of those things where I feel unsatisfied, and I, I think there was so many cool ways they could took it in the end, and it, 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 I guess it's technically to the credit of the show that there's so many things that I could have theorized that they could have ended this with, and that was a lot of fun that I had throughout the entire season, was theorizing what direction this can take the show, and how it can conclude, and granted, none of them really came into effect, but I was more upset in the idea that this thing was left untouched, like this thing was not resolved. And it's kind of an important thing to resolve. So that that's kind of where I sit. Is it's not that I was angry in the end, but I was kind of like, well, that was that wasn't as satisfying as I was hoping it to be. <laughs> like I didn't feel like I didn't roadmap. I think that's how I put it in my video. I didn't feel like there was a roadmap laid out. Like I didn't have a sense of, oh, well, I can see it going this way. Like I can see this direction being the way that it takes it. Now, granted, it has a I guess there is technically a roadmap, but it's not really a roadmap. It's more of like a the, the here's the 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 first sign that you would see. Like, okay, well, this is the direction it's going, but that's not necessarily that I know where that path will lead. So it kind of leaves it, like I said, very unsatisfying in the end. So, but it was it was a lot of fun watching it day, uh, week by week, just kind of theorizing what direction it would go, because being a time sensitive type of show, it, it does technically play off the idea of. You know, how can this thing, how can this path be altered based on the decisions that he makes? And it, it, it I, 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 it's, I, it's sad because I don't know that this will get a sequel or anything. Because I, from what I've heard from whispers from a couple of sources, I don't, I haven't really confirmed myself, is that it wasn't too popular in Japan. <laughs> and I think the theory is that people didn't like Koya, which I can kind of agree. He's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm of two minds of the main character. On one hand, he's very adult. He's not, like, pervy. He's not a dither at the same time. He's just very adult. And he thinks of everything in an adult way. He thinks of, this is the path that I must take. This is the thing that I'm striving for. Yes, there's these girls around him, but he's not, like, thirsty for them or anything. He's just focused on his future and his goal. And I think in that sense, he makes a lot of dumb decisions that affects those around him. And there's times where he does it again and again and I had times where I was like late in the show, like, are we really doing this again? Like, have we learned nothing? <laughs> and I don't know. I don't know which part of it frustrated people. But I do agree that that's what frustrated me was that he was willing to basically make the same mistake multiple times before he finally got it into his head. Maybe I should stop doing this because this is not a good thing. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know what, what technically would have triggered that. But I, I kind of found some frustration in him. 
And with the show so focused on him and not necessarily those around him, after I think after Nanako's story, it really kind of more focuses on Koya and what he chooses to do. So to have him kind of fall and be, make mistakes, I think makes him human, which I do appreciate. Because, yeah, people make mistakes multiple times, but not that many times. <laughs> it's like at some point, dude, you got to learn. Like you got to learn at some point that you need to stop doing this. But uh, I get, I think that was the charm of the show itself was that that push that he kept making that honestly kept blowing up in his face. So like I said, really great story. Um, really enjoyed it every week. Just a, just a not too satisfying ending. I do love the, the something that I, I don't think we really kind of touched on was the, the idea of corporate art versus actual art. And, and I, I like that they kind of balanced that out as well. Uh, mentioning the fact that, making an artist go down the corporate uh, direction can kind of quash um, inspiration and stuff like that. And I thought that was kind of a cool thing that they kind of touched on a little bit as well. Yeah, being a show about art clubs and stuff, I, I think the, the focus so much on art itself was really good. I think a lot of the a lot of the focus, a lot of the issues they face really do stem around the idea of what is your personal inspiration? What's your personal art, uh, or your artwork itself? And... I, it's funny because I, I do see it as being a thing of like corporate versus just your personal artistry. But I think another aspect of it that they technically do hit on is the idea of how do you get all of these things to merge to one and how the effects of time restraints has on artistry. Because essentially for quite a bit of the later part of the show, that's really what it's hitting on. Hitting timelines and hitting goals and trying to get everybody to work together is very difficult. It's very a director written story, <laughs> I think. Like it feels like the people behind the story itself really have a sense of what it takes to be a director and the effects that it has on artistry. And I really did like that aspect as well. So yeah. Remake Our Life, definitely a solid show. Just just be expecting not a bad ending, just a just like not a not a very fulfilling ending, I guess, is is the thing there. So, yeah, and cute characters. Next we have is How a Realist Hero Rebuilt the Kingdom, or Genjutsu Shugi Yusha no Okoku Saikinki. This one's streaming on Funimation, ran for 13 episodes, done by Studio JC Staff. The source is a light novel. The genres are action, military, harem, magic, romance, fantasy. The director was Takashi Watanabe, who did Kino's Journey, the movie, Slayer, Shaka no Shana, Heavy Object, and Arya the Scarlet Animal. Animal? Ammo? <laughs> and this one follows a guy named Kazuya Soma. And as it opens up, I totally forgot about this until now. <laughs> He's kind of sitting with his uh, grandfather, and his grandfather's talking about family and kind of the important things in life, and kind of was trying to push Soma as, you know, basically him having children and everything, grant him the ability to have such a great grandson that would be at his side and his deathbed. And he kind of wants that same thing for Kazuya. Like, please go find somebody, make a family, so that when you get old like me, you'll have somebody there for you in your final days. Don't be alone, essentially. Anyways, he's going to school and everything, and at some point, he gets transported to another world. He's summoned into this other world. Uh, I think it's called the Continent of Landia. But essentially, in this world, 10 years prior to him being summoned there, though, the demons have appeared in the north, and they have started taking over the continent forcing everybody, taking over like the third of a continent, forcing everybody to kind of come down to the south. And at some point, all these nations kind of formed a pact that they would all put funds into this sort of funding that would allow them to fight back against the demons. And anybody that's unable to <laughs> give in to those funds are kind of have to go and do this one thing, which is a summoning process. And they have to summon a hero from another world in order to pay for that, that debt. And so this particular world that he or this particular nation that he's summoned into is that particular issue so they summoned in Kazuya and it's so funny because it's like one of the things of like okay so Kazuya has been summoned here to fight the demons or something no it's just he's like a bargaining chip he just has to be sent over <laughs> might be experimented on or something but yeah we're gonna pay our debts by having you go over there so he goes hey, whoa, 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 okay before you do that let me see if I can somehow figure out your issue with your money so that you can pay that instead. And so that's what they do. They end up having him pretty much go through all their their documentations and all their fundings and stuff and figure out some way of bringing them out of debt, paying off that particular 
funding, and then that pretty much leads to him becoming the king of the nation, <laughs> to which he's basically ma managing the kingdom and helping it uh, solve its problems with famine, uh, food, all that kind of stuff, money, and all that, all those all those good things as it goes along. So, your thoughts on how a realist hero rebuilt the kingdom, which is getting a second season, by the way. I'm I'm very happy about that. I really do um, like this show. I mean, it's not the greatest show ever. Don't please don't I uh, don't let me over overhype this. But I do really like this. Um, it really hits on a lot of a lot of things that um, really work for me. Um, the the economic thing, the um, uh, a lot of kind of <laughs> almost propaganda ish things that he's doing. Um, there there's a lot of things involved in this show that I thought was decently well done um i i like a lot of the characters i think that um some of the the kind of more um administrative things that they're doing in this this show is kind of the cool um uh underplayed things that they're doing in this i kind of wish they'd do a little bit more in detail in a lot of these things but they're still there um uh, forestry um, in 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 the Elfin Kingdom. Um, some of the economic stuff. Then they start getting into kind of wartime um, strategies, which I thought was really interesting that they were trying to do some of that. Unfortunately, like I said, they're not going in depth in a lot of these things. It's all a very very surface level, and so that's probably my only real hiccup. I want more in a lot of this stuff, but for what it's doing. I think it's doing that really kind of cool. So um, I I just, I, I think it's a really well done show. Yeah, you know, I'm very mixed on this show because the show manages to sometimes uh, impress me then other times it really lets me down. And I think that's really where I sit where I'm like, okay, I'm enjoying this aspect and then I'm like, I'm not enjoying this aspect and I'm enjoying this aspect. And I enjoy it's very hit and miss for me. It's very ebb and flow up and down for me as I watch this show. And I, I think a lot of that has to do with, like, I enjoy, yes, I enjoy the build-a-nation aspects, and it does a lot of really cool stuff. I, I, I did like the, the aspect that there's times where he makes decisions and then he realizes that he's not doing enough, um, I, I think, I, at the same time. Okay, so that's a good example. So, the whole issue with the elves. So, he offers something to help the elves, and them not doing it leads to a disaster. So, he rushes over there, and he does good in rushing over there and helping but then he realizes that, well, I think it was uh, actually Licia was like, you know, you did well. And he's like, no, I didn't because I could have done so much to prevent this from being as worse as it was. I could have had training there. I could have had a support team there in case something like this happened. Well, you have a landslide. Well, you could have put training and personnel there to either prevent or to react to it rather than waste all this time waiting for somebody to get there which costs lives. So he realizes that even though he's doing something or he offered something, he's not doing enough. And I do like that. But then the down th thing is, no, that's not the result of you not putting something into effect. It's you not deviating. He doesn't deviate issues. Like he doesn't, pre you know, assign people to handle things, which again gets more into my bigger issue of the show is it building up things and then not properly managing them so it's cool that it's getting into certain subjects but at the same time doesn't properly do it i guess so one of the things that i've obviously uh criticized early on with the show is having this big huge announcement that he wants the best of the best the the most extreme talents to come forward he makes this big broadcast the entire nation if you have a specific talent that is unique to you come to me and what is it coming to the end? Like, I was so hyped and pumped for this. I'm like, cool, he's going to get, like, a cool blacksmith. Uh, they're having agricultural issues, which was basically hit on the episode before. They're having issues with crops. Everything is cotton, and they don't have export for cotton anymore, so they're basically starving uh, because they can't make money with the cotton and bring in fruit or whatever. So <laughs> all these ideas that I had, yeah, uh, uh, somebody for the elves. Bring in somebody that can actually manage to speak to the elves, whatever. What we get instead is a singer. We get a glutton. We get... <laughs> the other ones were good. I mean, technically, somebody who is basically a bookworm who's got a lot of knowledge. That's a good thing. Uh, uh, somebody that can basically speak to other races. That's a good thing. That's, that seems very unique, and it's very rare for that specific race. And the warrior, I can kind of see, you know, training soldiers or whatever. That's it. 
And I'm like, you had so many cool opportunities here to get into, yes, somebody that could uh, build stuff. You can get into this, yeah, again, the crops, somebody that is in agriculture, something like that. But it doesn't. So, like I said, it's a buildup. And then, like, really? Like, I, I ate a ton, and I don't know jack about food, but we'll go with that. And then it turns into basically QVC, shopping channel, <laughs> or a, a cooking network. And it's like, okay, this is not really solving a lot of issues around it. So why don't you just bring in a chef? It, it It's those kind of decisions that really kind of just brings it down as it builds it up and then brings it down and builds it up. So that's why I said it's, it's kind of like an ebb and flow for me. It has great moments that I just really love getting into essentially the dukedoms and how they essentially each have power to essentially if something goes wrong with the king, they can overthrow it. That stuff's interesting. It's funny because I, I made a joke at some point like, if you really like information dumps, this is a great show because literally every episode opens up with an info dump. And but there were info dumps that I liked because they were getting into the essentially the guts and how the world itself or the country itself works. And again, it's not necessarily doing the most creative stuff with that information that they're kind of presenting. So, yeah, I, I like the world. I like the setup. I like a lot of aspects of it. It's just there's so many points in it that kind of aggravate me. And the it, it, it's not that it aggravates me, um, which happens with a lot of shows. It aggravates me to a point where it kind of sours it. Like you, you have this concept, it's cool, and then you, you, you disappoint me so much that it sours it, and then I can't really enjoy it. So it was, it was a constant back and forth for me. Plus, the show looked, it looked bad. <laughs> there was so many. I'm not going to disagree on that one. <laughs> and and I feel bad because the studio technically. They struggled real hard with the later part because it, it basically gets into like a whole on full on battle. And it's like, you're not pulling this off. <laughs> you're not really pulling this off. And I feel really bad. This does not look good. Um, so, yeah, for quite a bit, it didn't really matter so much for the early parts because it's just a lot of talking and, and really dictating funding and all that kind of stuff. But the later part, when it does get into a battle, it's like you, we probably should have just not even done this. Just just narrate over some stills or something like that. Don't even try it. No, don't make the stuff move. You're not going to make it move well enough. It's it is funny because it, um when 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 all is said and done, I m- between me and Andrew, I think Poncho is absolutely the one character that is going to be the most disagreed upon character because I think Poncho is is probably one of the most interesting aspects and can I explain it? No, because I don't think that the show did well in explaining Poncho. Um, his his palette. I like it, and I can't explain it because the well, show didn't explain I, it well, which is exactly what Andrew doesn't like about it. it, it, it then that's the thing. I think that my speculation on him is more the reason why I think he's kind of crucial to what um, Kyoya or whatever Ka- Kazuya is is doing in the in in the um, the economic side. Him him. And his quote unquote palate and his interest in food as a he's he's not quite a chef, but he is played off as a chef. And that I think is main the main reason why he's such an interesting character in this world. Um, he his knowledge of food and bringing that to uh, Kazuya as, hey, we can do this with these kinds of foods and we can create this and that will make this kind of food good and therefore sellable. That's a lot of what Poncho is doing, and that that, like I said, that's going to be the the biggest disagreement between me and Andrew, it seems. But other than that, I like Poncho. So, well, again, it goes back to my point: why somebody that eats a lot? Why not somebody that cooks the stuff? There's like so many more options, and even still, then why not both? Why only these five? Why not so many other things that could have helped the nation? Searching for a bug or something somewhere that people eat that tastes good is fine and dandy, but why not build the infrastructure rather than trying to scrounge for something? It makes sense, but why not both at the same time? It, that that was, and again, it goes back to the whole thing where it's not necessarily Poncho that's my issue. It's not really necessarily that uh, having finding a singer to sing on your broadcast is is a bad thing. It's just a why not so many other facets that are technically in dire straits. Why focus on just broadcasting a singer talking to a glutton talking about a bug that they can eat? Why not so many other things that could technically develop the nation? And again, I think that goes back to they technically hit on it in the story in the idea that Soma does realize at some point that he's not 
adequate enough, which again was the whole land side thing. But it's in that thing where he doesn't DV out to enough people to manage so many things that are part of a nation. And why hit on the fact that he realizes that he's not adequate enough when he doesn't react to it, but decide to do another broadcast about food rather than working on establishing somebody that will actually help the elves with their issue with landslides. Again, maybe it's just not enough time to get into all those things, but why focus so much on the unimportant things when you do have an established issue that he's not addressing? So, I don't know. Like I said, it's a, it's an up and down for me. It's an up and down for me. So, not that it's a terrible show. Just it's a show that kind of, because of the ups and downs, kind of just becomes a middle ground for me. I'll be interested to see what happens in the second season. That's for sure. Like I said, technically, Tomoe, which is this girl that, again, has a very special talent that nobody else has. Everybody can eat like Poncho. A lot of people are bookworms like Hakia, but she was the mo most unique thing. But then what happens? She just disappears. <laughs> like, I, we finally show her, like, in the later episodes. I'm like, oh, hey, that's right. There was this one girl in the show. Suddenly, she's she's in the show again. So that's great. Um, yeah. We'll see. It's, it's getting a lot more involved with the more uh, continent as a whole. So I'm sure that what's going forward is probably going to be a lot more interesting than uh, just the, the nation itself, which I think has kind of figured its issues out for sure. So I'm, I'm, I'm very mixed on the, 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 the neighboring kingdom and how things were handled there. I, I, I really was, I really was struggling with that in particular episodes. I'm like, okay, we have to do another QVC event. <laughs> Why is it with the QVC? And I, I guess it's technical because I don't really feel like it was well portrayed. I end up reading where people were talking about exactly what all unfolded there. Um, and I, so I guess I can technically chop it up as a, uh, a bad adaptation moment, but it kind of sucks to not really have a full perspective of exactly what happens somewhere. Be upset by how it was portrayed because you realize how much content they've, they've cut from it. So we'll see. We'll see. I, I guess I can chop up a lot of the stuff as just me missing context to a lot of things. So that's how a realist hero rebuilt the kingdom. Check that out if that sounds interesting to you. The Eden Deities No Only Peace or Hayon Sedai no Itadachi. Itadendachi, sorry. Uh, this one streamed on Crunchyroll and High Dive, ran for 11 episodes. Studio is MAPPA. The source is a manga. The genres are action, adventure, fantasy, seinen, demons. Series composition and script was done by Hiroshi Seko, who did Ajin, Jujutsu Kaisen, Cabinet of the Iron Fortress. Uh, web manga creator itself, the original creator, was Amahara, who, of course, did Interspecies Reviewers. And, of course, the mangaka that made the manga, published manga that this was based off of, is Shinja Kyokun, who, of course, did Miss Kobayashi's Dragon Maid, so... Very interesting there. This one basically follows a world where essentially mankind's thoughts and prayers can produce Edens. And these Edens just pop up randomly around the world, kind of birth from those thoughts and prayers from the humans. Technically, they're just born from thoughts and prayers of any being. But obviously, because humans have the most thoughts in the world itself, it's, it's mostly them being born from the humans. There's one particular girl named Paula who essentially was partially brought to by the thoughts and prayer or thoughts of birds. So she's able to speak to birds, but mostly most of her is also human as well. Uh, but essentially also in this world <laughs> are demons. And at some point in the past, uh, over, over 100, 800 years ago, they essentially had so many demons around the world that were basically slaughtering humans that lots of Edens were born. And they all basically sacrificed themselves in order to seal away the demons and leaving only one person, only one Eden behind, which was Brandon. Um, jump forward 800 years, and several Edens have been born since then, and Ren's still watching the seal because she's really crushed by the fact that everybody that she loved was sealed away at, uh, to make the seal, and all these other Edens are kind of popping up. Namely, and most importantly, uh, Yeasley, which Yeasley is a very rare case in a Eden who has found interest in looking into the humans. So he's actually submerged himself into the world of humans, their books, their knowledge, everything like that, uh, even one of their nations, to the point where you start to get an insight through Yeasley, um, as the Edens, through Yeasley, to what's going on in the human world, which is essentially one of these nations of humans is actually head by demons that have somehow disguised themselves as humans, and they are going on this big rampage, uh, big conquest to conquer the entire world, uh, which is the Zobal Empire. And so, being that the Edens seem to not like demons existing and they will kill demons as they wish uh they don't like that so they're trying to figure out 
which these humans inside this old empire are actually the demons so they can kill them separately because they don't they're not just going to really want to go and massacre all the humans so yeah that is that is the Eden deities no only peace and so like as it goes along you'll kind of learn more about how the Edens function how they come to be um, you'll learn more about the demons and how they are somehow taking the form of humans uh, what the demons are after uh, all that kind of stuff is is really kind of the focus of it so yeah, this is easily probably one of my favorite anime in a long time, um, and for really unique, interesting ways. I will be perfectly upfront that this show is extremely, I think how he put it is that Amahara, who is the original creator of the series, not Kyoko, because uh, Kyoko is basically just adapting and publishing the manga based off of Amahara's web manga. Uh, Amahara, who again did Interspecies Reviewers, obviously has zero filters. <laughs> And does a lot of things that are very, very, very controversial. And I think it's in that is why I love this series so much is because anything that really needs to happen will happen. Like very upsetting things are obviously happening because it's kind of an upsetting and controversial world. <laughs> demons don't necessarily have filters like everybody else does. So the demons will do very inappropriate things that I think most people would be upset by. You know, it's funny because when I watched the show, the first episode obviously ends with a very inappropriate scene. It's an R scene, if, if people know what I'm talking about. It's a scene that is obviously going to be very upsetting. And even me at the time, when I seen that scene being portrayed, I felt like it was disrespectful the way that it was portrayed because it was whimsical. It was whimsical about it. But I didn't realize until I finished the show and then I remembered that first scene that I'm now fine with it because I realized that it was whimsical for a reason. It's a screwed up world. The demons are screwed up. The humans that are under the demons are screwed up. And it was portraying exactly what was happening in this world. That they were okay with this stuff. And that's equally with the Edens too. Because it seems like... It, I realize at some point like later in the season, I'm like, I don't really know who I'm rooting for. Because I don't really like anybody. <laughs> and I think that was a cool thing. Because the Edens didn't see morales and issues the same way humans did. There's a, there's a lot of points in the show where... Humans are talking to the Edens and going, why is this happening? Why is this okay to you? And they're going, well, we just don't see anything wrong with that. We don't, we, we as Edens don't see things the way humans do, even though they take the form of humans. And equally, the demons are about survival and they're willing to do anything to survive. So getting into how they possibly procreate and reproduce is a, a thing in this world. And that's how they handle it. And again, it's not something that you're going to be happy with. So again, like I said, I think the lack of those filters is exactly what I love about the series because Amahara really does tell the story that they see this world as being, which again is technically unsettling and it's disgusting because it involves emotionless uh, eat it ends. It involves demons that will do anything to survive. And I like that mashup. So yeah, it looks fantastic. It's done by Mappa. It's got incredible animation pieces. I love the color and the vividness of this particular uh, animation. It The colors pop. It's got a very unique style to it. Uh, obviously, Shinja Kulkun did the uh, character designs as well, and I think they look fantastic. Um, there's so many great things about the show, and I think a lot of my enjoyment is just in the world itself, not having any filters or borders to it, that it tells the story that it tells. And it was, it was interesting because... <laughs> What I what was really interesting about the series is that at some point I was let down by, quote unquote, the bad guy of the show, like not really being that much of an issue. The Indians are stupid, like stupid, powerful, like they, they are literally the gods of this world and there's nothing that really can stand up against them. And to have like, again, specifically with the demons, they're not really immortal or anything like that. These demons can be killed. They can actually they can even starve. So they're not really even that powerful. Whereas the Edens don't have to sleep, they don't have to eat, they're, they're, they don't have like a, they're, the way their body works doesn't really necessarily have like organs that can finish them. So it's very one-sided, <laughs> it's a very one-sided story. But at some point I realized, man, this show like literally, I guess the best way to explain it is there's cockroaches in the world. And they can't really be squashed, they just, they somehow manage to still be there. And to see this strive for survival on the other end of the spectrum was really cool. And I loved how at some point I realized, wow, wait, they I think they can actually pull this off. And to have that moment where you go, there this is one-sided, and to realize that there's some way that they can actually pull this off 
was really cool. That realization that I had was like, this is great. Like, this is really great. Now, the big issue <laughs> that this show has is unfortunately, there is zero prospects of a continuation. Um, there's obviously a lot of people that are keeping hope, and I'm all for that. I, I want to keep hope for there to be more of this because it, it's really, really great. I really love this. Like I said, this is probably one of the my most favorite shows I've had in a long time of this kind of caliber, this sort of type of show. And the problem is that Amahara, who did the original web manga, the original creator, has had this on hiatus since 2016. It's five years. They have nothing that they've added to the story. Um, so the, the idea is like, okay, well, then why was this adapted? My assumption is that there's two things that I can, that I can think of. Um, one being probably the more better of the options. The first one is obviously, I think a lot of the production, a lot of the uh, news announcements was saying that this was based on a manga by Shinja Kokun. So it's essentially an advertisement for a manga that is being published. Well, how far is that manga? Not very far into the series. The anime is beyond what Shinja has done so far. So maybe they're just advertising this new adaptation that's being published to get, you know, get sales. Or is there hope that this is a, a gauge of interest for either Shinja to, or for Amahara to come back and continue the story? Or possibly just to bring Amahara into the you know, production of an anime original continuation by MAPPA? I would love that second part, but I'm probably leaning more that that's the first part, which is just to <laughs> obviously advertise this adaptation. But at the same time, is is the hope that Amahara is going to give the the mantle to uh, Shinja to continue it? That would be that would probably be the interest there, is if possibly Shinja has a good enough idea of what Amahara wants and to continue to continue it on. That's a big question mark. So yeah, I do have to put a big huge warning in here. The ending is not a good ending. <laughs> It is a very cliffhanger ending. <laughs> Things are in very bad positions at the end of it. Uh, I think somebody made a joke. I don't know if it's Genghis or somebody. Like, they, they need a leg up. It is that bad. <laughs> it is a very bad spot to leave it. Um, so I will put that out there. It is it is not going to have an ending. But at the same time, it doesn't even affect me. Like, I, I've been through, we talked about Spirit Chronicles and how much that ending frustrated me. I don't really care with this situation because I loved the journey so much. I loved digging into the show. I loved how it's willing to put it into things. I love um, put uh, just some really uncomfortable things into position to kind of solidify how uh, difficult this world is to live in. And to have those emotional impacts to me, to have those uh, upsetting moments for me, a lot of those things were exactly why I loved it. I love the characters, the color, the art the animation, um, the mechanics of the world are just so fleshed out. Uh, how the Edens are born, how how certain things can affect the Eden when it's born. Uh, those kind of aspects were really, and I was really into. The characters are fantastic. Easily, I couldn't figure out for the longest time. I wasn't sure if he was going to be a good guy or a bad guy. Uh, Ren seemed like she, there was nothing to her, but at some point, they just fully fleshed her out and and completely changed her as a character later on, which I'd never seen coming. Uh, even Obami, the demons are really fascinating. Hayato, I think Hayato's the only weak character. He just wants to get stronger. He's the shonen character, uh, but he's so not a focus of the show at all, so don't get me wrong. Paula's adorable, loved her to death. Uh, Miku. Miku is literally probably my favorite villain in anime history. I loved Miku. Miku was, <laughs> again, I don't like Miku because she does horrible things, so don't get me wrong, she's a villain character. You're not going to agree with what the villain character does at all. But because the character makes sense and is so... She's such a genius. Like, she is a, an absolute genius. And she's literally probably why why that later part of the show really kind of made me go, I cannot believe they're pulling this off. Uh, Miku is a very fantastic... I think Miku is the reason why I end up falling in love with the show so much later on. Um, and I is she's literally the reason why I want more of the show. Like, I really want to see what Miku does. And that was, yeah, she's a fantastic, she's a fantastic villain. I love her to death. Um, similar to like, I think the last time I had a villain that I liked that much was probably um, Mother from um, the Promised Neverland. But uh, yeah, Miku's Miku's amazing, and I, she's definitely going to be in my one of my favorite characters of this year. So yeah, that's that's kind of where I stand. I I absolutely love this show. 
Um, it is extremely controversial. It, there, it does a lot of things that are very disgusting, but I think those are the reasons why it works so well for me. And I just, I hope that there's more. I really do. I, I, I might even, I might even, if the manga gets caught up to the anime at some point, I will probably definitely jump into the manga. Uh, hopefully, like I said, hopefully that Shinja has some good insights from Amahara on where they would want to go. Because it, honestly, Amahara is why this show is so great. So I don't necessarily know that Shinja has done anything this this uh, controversial. So <laughs> Shinja is really doing things that are more like fun and happy and heartful and, and comedy. So I don't know necessarily that Shinja is going to know how to write a story that is this dark and this uh, controversial. So yeah, Eden Didi is the only piece easily one of my favorite anime in a long time uh i just want more i really do i badly want more so yeah moving on well i started out wanting to watch the show <laughs> yeah uh drugstore in another world the slow life of a cheat pharmacist or cheat kushushi no slow life isekai ni sukuro drugstore this one streamed on credit Crunchyroll. Crunchyroll. Ran for 12 episodes, uh, done by Studio EMT Squared. The source is a light novel. The genres are comedy and fantasy. Uh, did you actually finish this? Yeah. This is like, <laughs> I, I, of course, like manage, I usually manage our uh, queue list for each site. And this one was like, I kept wanting to delete it off of there because the season was over. And it just kept showing me that it was like, continue episode 11. I'm like, Chris, when are you going to finish this stupid thing? And then the other day, I'm like, Chris, when are you going to finish this so I can get it off the list? Because it's the last thing I have to get off the list. And he's like, oh, I have more to watch? Like, yes, it's it's saying it does. <laughs> so, Did you end up having or you just accidentally went back to the previous episode and it reset everything? No, I I, I had to watch episode 11 and 12 last night. Oh, okay. Okay. So I wasn't I wasn't wrong. Uh, so yeah, this basically follows Reiji. He is an Isekai. guy. It doesn't explain why, and maybe it does eventually, but it opens up basically saying that, you know, he's here. Do you want to know, know what episode they cover that? 12 episode 12 okay <laughs> it really felt like it didn't care to like it, it, when it opens up it's like it literally i think it literally says uh he's a sekai we're not really gonna explain it or something like that it was it was funny or the isekai character or something but anyways he's a sekai he's working at a pharmacy that he's opened up along with noera and nina mina and they make different things to help the people around obviously taking a lot of inspiration from the previous world to make things like soap and detergent and stuff like that so yeah, your your thoughts. It's not a real bad. Uh, he's 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 one of the probably most vanilla um, <laughs> isekai ever. I mean, he 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 just hates his job and then wakes up and he's in another world. That's it. <laughs> Pretty much like what ninety uh, percent of all isekais are from like some sort of black company that they die from. Yeah, Death <laughs> March. Um, what was the one that was here recently? Well, he didn't even die. He oh, just woke uh, up. Slime. I've been killing slime for three hundred years. It's and and it's it's th- this show is as close to Iyashike as you can get without actually being an Iyashike. It's 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 pretty much just something that somebody wants and he makes it makes the um quote unquote medicine it, which is a miracle medicine of some sort, um and that medicine solves problem and then cute girls dote on him. That's pretty much this show. Um, yeah, there's a it's little like, bit. It's like the opposite of Dr. Stone because like Dr. Stone, it's like, we need to make this. Well, okay, it's time to get to science. Then we need to do this first and that'll make this. And then we need to make these two, two together, which will make this thing. And oh yeah, bye. We need to add this over to it <laughs> and that'll make this thing. Uh, Reggie's like, okay, let's grab like three random things from the ground that I don't even know what they are. And then I do a little, you know, magical pose dance thing. And then boom, it's, it's detergent. <laughs> it's like, there's not even like an explanation of how it makes it. It's just slap these things together, do a dance and it's, it's detergent or it's an energy drink. Yeah, pretty much. And, and that, and so in, in, in some, we don't case, want you to think too much watching the show. <laughs> you relax. We don't need to get in the science of things. Watch Dr. Stone. If you want that, you, you have roughly three kind of quote unquote medicines per episode. And, it, and it, there, there's a lot of, cutesy in the show um a lot of um goofy hijinks involved um a a pretty large cast um overall um some characters will come in and out over the course of the show so all in all it, it was it was a just just above um you know i i'm i'm i come away from it you know just very warm on it i i did enjoy myself watching it it's a it's very much a Turn off your brain and just enjoy the cute girls for a little while and 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 have fun. Yeah. This is a drugstore in another world. 
Nighthead 2041. This one streamed on Crunchyroll for 12 episodes, done by Studio Shirogumi. Uh, I've previously done revisions, so you know what we're getting into here, CGI. <laughs> uh, genres are sci-fi, mystery, psychological, supernatural drama. Uh, this is based off of a 1992 TV drama in, to in Japan, uh, Japanese TV drama. And the writer of the series for this particular series, this adaptation of it, is uh, George uh, Giorgi uh, Ida, who was the director of the original 1992 drama. So that's interesting. It had a previous anime adaptation, which was, I think, Nighthead Genesis or something like that. I have not watched that. So a nice thing here is apparently based on what I've heard and what it seemed like watching this. You don't have to watch the previous stuff. This is a full new adaptation of it. Uh, so yeah, this one follows basically two perspectives in a kind of like not so distant future kind of thing. Well, obviously, you see Night, uh, Nighthead 2041, so 19, so 2041. But it basically follows the perspective of two sides of the situation. One side is by the Kitahara brothers, which are these two siblings, Naoto and Naoya. And they have basically finally escaped from this facility that they have had to live in pretty much their entire life. And they were kind of told as they leave, or as they escape, that the world outside would accept them for who they are, which is psychics. They have psychic abilities that they can use. And it seems like there has been issues with psychics in the past, and so now they believe, now they can leave the facility, they're going to go out to a world that is going to be acceptant of them. Well, <laughs> based on like the first encounter they have, which is at some kind of random bar out in the middle of nowhere, and based on what was on the television, no, this world does not accept psychics, not at all. Not at just that, but the world itself is essentially, if there's any sign whatsoever that you either believe, speak, um, practice, or partake in anything that has to do with the supernatural, you will be arrested, possibly killed, possibly put into prison. Like, if you have an... They, they keep in the entire show, they have, like, three instances where somebody's reading an Akita book. Like, an Akita manga can get you thrown in jail or possibly executed. There's, like, no, no religion. Nothing that has to do with supernatural is allowed in this world. Everything is of the physical. They feel like anything supernatural will just harm society as a whole... Um, it, mainly this is in Japan. It seems like in this story, Japan is like the most like strong arm about it. The government does not allow it. Whereas there's some other nations where there's issues where they feel like everything's blamed by the fact that people allow some sort of aspect of supernatural. Um, so yeah, obviously the Kitahara brothers are a little upset about this. <laughs> the, the world's not going to accept them, obviously. Uh, at the same time, on the other side of the perspective, we get a look at these other two brothers, Yuya and Takuya, who are the Kuroki br uh, brothers. They are a part of the SWE, which is the Japan's special forces that handle anything to do with Supernatural. So if somebody finds out that somebody has an Akita manga, they send the SWE to go over there and, and basically imprison you. And there's at some point they'll actually show the facility where the SWE is. They actually have like public shaming cells, basically, where you can actually walk up or drive up. And there is just this wall of all these prisons where they went, they went, there's open windows where you can see the actual prisoners inside basically doing time for, again, they showed one that was like, a, it was a small child that literally drew a wizard. There's like a, a, a grandma who went to pray for her um, her her husband. Uh, just anything. There was one that <laughs> they they sung their child a, 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 a like an old uh, rhyme or something like that that had something supernatural in it. So very rough world <laughs> for that particular aspect. So but like I said, the Takia, the uh, Kuroki brothers are working for this organization. They're actually supposed to go out and find these people and imprison them. Of course, from their perspective, they feel like they're trying to do what's right. That that anything supernatural is dangerous for the world because they've been obviously raised in the society. So having these two pers perspectives is really interesting as it goes on to the story. You'll eventually find out at some point that there is like this. Uh, there was a World War Three, which was like in 2023, I think it was. And there's like a mystery around what happened there. There's like a time gap where a lot of people in the world don't even remember what happened in that time, like a like three year period where nobody even remembers what happened then. Um, a lot of really crazy things that are kind of being set up in the background to really kind of create the mystery that is, what the hell happened to this world? <laughs> why why is it acceptance of supernatural abilities? Why is it so against supernatural abilities? What happened in the past that caused this? Um, all these things. Why does the world think that supernatural things don't exist when obviously the Kirahara brothers use them? It's very much mystery. Obviously, very right off the bat in the first episode, you find out that the Kuroki brothers start manifesting supernatural abilities. And so now they're working for an organization that hunts them down while they have those abilities. Um, so, yeah, pretty much a, an interesting little setup to the whole ordeal. 
Uh, every now and then, this girl named Shoko randomly appears. She's like this girl that's still in like a, a schoolgirl outfit, and she just kind of randomly appears and says something about things not connecting, and if things don't connect, things are going to be dangerous. A bunch of weird riddle stuff. And so, obviously, figuring out what the hell she's talking about is an important aspect, too. So, yeah. So, the elephant in the room, obviously, CGI, full CGI. Um, yes, obviously, early on, I'm like, ah, crap, it's CGI. Very detailed, very good-looking CGI. I actually really did like it. And not only that, but I think the the efforts that the Wits they put into it, along with, like, really fantastic music. Like, this show has such good music. Um, coupling really fantastic music with really cool action scenes made this show worth it for me. Like, I absolutely loved the animation and the action scenes in this series. Add to that, I love the story. I love the background. I love the mystery of it. I think it does really well in, you know, obviously there's kind of a mixture. There's shows that really reveal too much, and then the mystery's not really there. There's a lot of shows that hold their cards way too long, and you really kind of go, what is even the point of watching this if you're if you're never really going to show me something? Uh, Sunny boy. <laughs> this one does really good in kind of slowly revealing those cards, um, addressing why is there this time gap that people don't know? What happened in World War Three? Why is the world so not accepting of uh, uh, psychic powers? What is the origins of the psychic powers? All these kind of things are really cool to kind of slowly unravel as it goes along. And so I think that mixture of really good pacing, really good reveals, great action animation, uh, just so much great detail in the action scenes too, with that great music, it made this show really fantastic for me. I actually really love this series going all the way through it. Um, so yeah, I, I, I really did like the series. I think there's it's got a lot here. I think it's kind of unfortunate that obviously a lot of people will not ever watch it because it's CGI. Um, I would tell people, please give it a shot. Don't let that kind of hinder it. Give it a shot. It had a lot of great things to offer here that I really did enjoy in the end. So uh, I, I think the only poor thing about the show is probably the two siblings. I I think the Kitahara brothers, I liked them mainly in the idea that they were kind of the outsiders really kind of dealing with um, a lot of really crap, a lot of, a lot of really bad um, decisions and dealing with having to be basically outsiders of the world that should accept them. I didn't really get much from the Kuroki brothers. Granted, Takuya had some great moments. He was kind of the headstrong, we have to listen to our commanders, but then at some point realizing that maybe this is not the best decision. Um, but I think the the two siblings aren't really the strongest characters. I think the world itself and a lot of the side characters are probably the more well-thought-out stuff. I will give a content warning. It does get pretty violent at times. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's really portrayed as being extremely violent, but... Like, I mean, one example, having this one kid who basically <laughs> forces a bunch of people to shoot themselves. It gets it gets it gets pretty, I guess, um, it, it's just like a bunch of soldiers just shooting the crap out of each other kind of thing. They had some really fantastic episodes. I, th I think the episode with the mind control was probably one of my favorite episodes where you basically have this school is um, dealing with um, people ending their own lives and when they kind of go in there and things kind of start hitting the fan it was like wow this is a really fantastic episode the later episodes like i think the level episode 11 or 12 they had some really fantastic action scenes i think my only other down besides like i said the the, the, two, the two main sibling pairs weren't really all that interesting um is probably the ending it was a, it was a little bit of a letdown it was a nice wrap up. Like I, I could see that being like the easiest, not really the easiest, um, probably the most satisfying ending they can really give it without really getting crazy. So I did enjoy. I think it was a satisfying ending. It was just kind of a. Eh, I, I, I could have done something more cool with it. It was anticlimactic. There you go. It was a satisfying ending, just not. Uh, it was anticlimactic. So yeah, I had twenty forty one. Really fantastic show, even if it is CGI. So <laughs> really cool action scenes, though. Really cool. The Dungeon of Black Company, or Make You uh, Black Company. This one's streaming on Funimation, ran for 12 episodes, done by Studio Silverlink, sources of manga. Genres are comedy and fantasy. This one's series composition was done by Hitomi Muino, who's obviously done crap tons of stuff. She's done Snow White with the Red Hair, Amanchu, Flying Witch, Noragami, uh, Higehiro. She's a fantastic series composition writer, so... Yeah, this series follows a guy named Ninomiya, and in the current times, Japan, he is the very successful at a very young age. He basically did some really good investments. At some point, invested in a bunch of uh, apartments, skyscrapers and stuff, and has gotten to the point now where he literally can become the ultimate neat. And the idea that 
he's basically set for life and he could just be lazy for the rest of his life. And as he's celebrating the this final moment where he's achieved this and he's looking down upon all the poor peons that still have to work and stuff, he finds himself transported into another world. And in this other world, he has to be forced to basically be like a, a typical miner. So essentially, the this this mining company will go down in dungeons, mine up uh, precious ore that's needed for all the stuff that the world is kind of run off of. And there's other departments in this particular company which will like refill treasure boxes for uh, adventurers that go down into the dungeon to kill monsters. And um, yeah, there's other ranks higher up which are basically the adventurers that go in and explore things. But yeah, he's back to working for life, and it doesn't look good. But he's not going to let that keep him down. He's actually seeking to find some devious way of making it to where he doesn't have to work again. So he'll craft different uh, ideas of things that he can do in order to get a leg up. And most of the time, that just blows up in his face because it wouldn't be fun if he just got <laughs> everything again. So uh, at some point, he runs into Remu, who is like this big dra dragon thing, and he kind of offers to her to not eat him, but instead he'll feed her delicious stuff. And so now he's got an overpowered dragon that eats too much. And uh, Wanibe, who is just another poor guy that has to slave in these these locations as well. So your thoughts? This this show is kind of all over the place for me. I in in some respects I really like it. Um I it it has this um going back to what what I was saying with the other show, this kind of feel of wanting to um use the system um to get yourself in into a a comfortable position. And this one kind of does that. Um, the uh, Norima is uh, Norimiya is Ninomia. Ninomia, that's his name. He's he's got this this um, kind of underhanded genius to him, where he he wants he he's he's going to go out of his way. He doesn't care who he has to step on to get to this point where he can um, he can better himself. So in 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 a lot of respects that it that that comes through and it and it it does it really well in a lot of cases um and everybody in both loves him and hates him at the same time and it, th it, this comes out in a lot of cases especially in the latter episodes when when it's almost like everybody else is going what a what a horrible person and everybody's like Every, all of his main part quote unquote party members are like no that's that's just who he is he he's just doing what he's natural at doing so it, it it plays that off and it plays it off pretty well. Um, but the problem that I probably have, the biggest problem that I have with the show is that it tries so hard to um, play on its jokes that it kind of almost overkills those jokes. And I think that's probably my biggest problem with it. While in some cases the jokes are funny, don't get me wrong. Other one, other Other times it's like, okay, let's let's move on and get to another joke it it, it and it's the main reason why i came into this show which was uh uh him and his you know quote unquote building a a kind of um system to better take care of himself that's not the main focus it's more around the weird hijinks of him doing his underhanded thing and it's really not all that underhanded and the jokes kind of tend to over overstay their welcome all in all i like the show i kind of wish it was a little bit more to it i i hope that if if it does get more um they they get a better handle on their jokes um so that that is where it is yeah i think this this the concept of the show itself was really good starting out i mean i granted it's it's a lot to do with his selfishness early on it's like well it's, the entire thing is his selfishness <laughs> is, is it what do you, what can he do to put other people underneath him in order to reach something and it was it was interesting because early on it was like man this guy's kind of a jerk but at the same time everybody's acknowledging it and you realize yeah this is probably gonna blow up in his face yeah it blows up in his face yeah so he always gets his due in the end like he'll do something really nasty pushing people to the limits in order to not have him actually work and then at some point it'll kind of just blow up in his face and I and I kind of was okay with that that particular formula early on, and I think at some point I realized I need to of course go back and get caught up on the show in order to do a review of it. And I was so I was like maybe four episodes in when we did our first impressions, and so when I got went back to actually watch the show again, from then on it was like 
what did, what did we do with this show? Like, I, it didn't feel funny beyond that point. Like, I it was a it was like it was so focused on the whole black company aspect. For those that don't know what a black company is, it's basically it's a term in Japan where it's a company that essentially overworks its people for very low pay, no time off, a lot of overtime, and there's a lot of stigma around it because obviously the besides the low pay, this idea that you can't really speak up against it because if you're not working along with the rest of the team you're just going to burden everybody. And so often people just kind of accept it and move on and keep working even though there's no chance for moving up, there's no chance for better pay, there's no chance to actually get paid for overtime, all that kind of stuff is just, is, is frowned upon. So, um, and that's kind of the concept they're trying to do here is this kind of, this concept of building a black company in this other world where everybody works tirelessly for low pay in order for the higher ups to you basically see the profit. And like I said, that that concept essentially, I think, takes over the show for the later half of it. And it was not really, not really funny beyond that point. Like there was, there was a time here and there where something would funny would pop up, but for the most part, just didn't seem like it was really going for comedy anymore. It really just seemed like it was going for any sekai black company. <laughs> Literally, what it is, it was like it was no longer funny. It was just let's take the concept of black company and the concept of isekai and throw them together. Isn't this great? And it wasn't really, it, for me, it was just kind of, it lost a lot of its flavor, and I wasn't really, I had to really push myself for the lighter part of it. And maybe some people will find a lot of stuff that I didn't see that being comedy to be funny, because obviously comedy is subjective. Uh, some people might find the entire second half hilarious. Again, for me, for my taste in comedy, it didn't just didn't really do anything for me for the later part of it. So, I don't know. Uh, I guess it, it's it's intriguing in, in one end, because it's definitely doing a lot of different things. I think early on when I was talking about the show, I felt like this was probably the one of the most unique isekais I've seen in a long time. It's doing just things that you don't really see in isekais. I'm getting more of a, not necessarily a nation building isekai, more of a company building isekai. And the stuff that it was doing very early on was very intriguing to me. And I, I was like, man, this has a lot of potential of doing some really crazy stuff that I've just never really seen in isekai. So if you're looking for something unique in an isekai, it has it in spades. Like I said, I've never really seen a lot of this stuff done before in any set guy's show corporatizing fantasy elements <laughs> right exactly that's exactly what it is it's it's the okay how do you make a lot of profits from random ore inside of a dungeon how do you stock up dungeons to keep it you know processing for the 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 heroes to come down in there and the adventurers to go down in there and to uh take on things all that stuff is very unique and it was the stuff that like i said early on with the series i was really interested in it's just for me the later half of it was like I guess you just ran out of like it, it. This is like one of those prime examples of like this person, this writer makes a really, or I guess a manga uh, makes a really solid first volume, has some creative ideas, really cool concept. People are sold on it, and then beyond that, they're like, I don't even know what to do with it. <laughs> I don't know what to do with this, so I'm just gonna keep, I guess, doing the same thing. I don't know. Um, that's the unfortunate thing is I think it had a really cool setup. Just. I guess didn't really have much behind it to do with it after that. So it's unfortunate. I, I, I really was, I, like I said, I, I think I was selling, I think I was selling on this show really heavy early on. I think I even made a video that was about isekais and this was one of my uh, top recommended just because it felt like it was doing something very unique and it just didn't really do nothing with it later on. So and if that sounds interesting to you, definitely check it out though. The Dungeon of Black Company. Remain. This one streamed on Funimation, ran for 12 episodes, done by Studio Mappa. Sources original. The genres are school and sports. The director of this series was Kiyoshi Matsuda, who did Kakaguriri XX and Kumamiko. The writer was Masafumi uh, Nishida, who did the was the creator of Tesla Notes and did series composition for Tiger and Bunny. So this one follows uh, a guy named Minato. And Minato in junior high was a very well known uh, part of probably one. Of, I think they won the uh, the prefectures or something like that for water polo. Um, so he's very successful at water polo along with his team. But unfortunately, as his junior year, year junior high years were ending, uh, he was driving home with his mother and his uh, sister, and they got in a car accident. And Minato was knocked out for I think, six months. He was in a coma, unable to move, obviously not waking up. And unfortunately, when he finally wakes up, yes, very conveniently, <laughs> he forgets his entire years in junior high and his teammates show up to see him, and he's like, I don't even know who you guys are. He forgets everything about his last, you know, three or so years of being in water polo and everything. 
And this is kind of obviously devastating to everybody because they all believe that Hino was really into the water polo. He was obviously very successful. He could have gone on to being Japan's best, but now he doesn't remember any of it. He just kind of wants to continue on with his life. So obviously his family is very kind of supportive of him. Like, you know, whatever you want to do, don't force yourself to get into water polo. If you just want to continue on, that's fine. Obviously, he doesn't know anything about it, so he's like, okay, I don't really know about water polo, but I see all these pictures on my wall and stuff of my friends playing water polo, but I don't really want to do that. Uh, obviously, the other problem is that he has to get caught up for his entire junior year, uh, junior high year of schooling, so that's another thing he has to kind of focus on, but even still, he moves on to um, kind of move on with his life, and at some point, uh, somebody recognized him, obviously at his new school, somebody recognized him and says, you need to join our water polo club because obviously you were this, you know, this... Uh, prodigy of water polo. He's like, no, I don't really want to do it. Eventually, they kind of rope him into it, and he finally joins the water polo team, starts learning about water polo all over again. Obviously, some people are a little bit upset in the idea that, hey, this guy is supposed to be a prodigy, and he's not able to play water polo, even though he was such a successful water polo player. Uh, he has one of his co-highs from his previous school that keeps kind of hitting on the idea of, wow, he was like so good at this, and now he just sucks. And it's like, well, duh, because he's been unconscious for six months. He lost pretty much his entire athletic self because obviously being in a bed for six months, you lose a lot of muscle mass and everything. Um, obviously, he's not going to remember anything because he's lost his memories. But even still, he tries to continue on. He tries to move on with his life, relearn water polo, kind of keep facing a lot of the people in his past, um, building up this new club and trying to move on with his life. So at some point, he ends up running into this girl that uh, immediately kisses him and he's like, "What? What? Wait, what? Were you a thing in junior high?" And she's like, "No, I actually didn't like you, and and uh, you you pretty much confessed to me, and I I rejected you, but then you said that if you uh, win the nationals, or whatever, I would give you a kiss, and so here's your kiss." And oh yeah, there was another thing, and that was that was what erupted him into actually playing was because she tells him, "Oh yeah, there was another one that I guess you're gonna lose because he wasn't gonna go back into water polo," and she's like, "Well, I guess I win that one." He's like, "Well, what is that one?" you were supposed to become Japan's best in high school. And oh, obviously, I guess I win because you're not going to do water polo. He's like, oh, crap. Well, how much say you It was like this exorbitant amount of money that he was going to have to pay her. So it kind of forced him into having to play water polo. So yeah, it's a pretty good, pretty solid uh, opening for it. This show, um, so just to get out of the way, obviously, I think Chris is pretty much on the same page as me. We're not really huge fans of sports shows. Um, I think one of the few sports shows I've ever, really ever enjoyed are usually more character focused rather than uh, the sport focus. So that's where we're coming from. So if you're looking for a sports heavy show, I think you'll get a little bit of it in here. Um, but technically, this show is more slice of life than sports. It's more drama than sports. Because, I mean, for example, I think it takes like four episodes before they even have a water polo match. Like this, this show does not care about the water polo itself. It's the, it's the, I guess technically the thing that is driving the story is the fact that he was a part of water polo and everything. But it's not really the focus. Um, and then there's like maybe like three or so episodes later on that they have some decent matches going on. A lot of the focus is on Minato, what he has lost and the struggle of what he's going to gain. Because obviously, like I said, he has to basically rebuild his body. He has to relearn the sport itself. It's basically the the concept of the, the 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 term remain is the concept of rebuilding that. So it is technically all about Minato, what he's lost, the struggles of the family around him. Obviously, his mother's like devastated because she feels like she robbed him of his his future. Um, so there's a lot of that aspect that's kind of there in the background. Um, obviously, like even with his sister, she kind of is struggling with the fact that Minato has changed a lot. So. Everybody around him is sort of affected by what he's lost and what he could possibly choose to do in the future. Even then, there's also the aspect expectations of Minato. Like, the, his club leader literally brings in a whole bunch of people to join the club because he tells everybody, we have this guy that was literally the Nationals winners in the past. We need to bring everybody in. Everybody's excited because they're going to get join a club with this guy that's literally a ace at uh, water polo. And then he's like, no, look, please don't put those expectations on me. I don't remember anything about that. I don't even have a body for that. Don't put that on me. So it has a great cast of characters, too. I love them all. Joe's really kind of upbeat. Uh, you get a little bit into him as his relationship with his father. Uh, Koshi Haru, who's like a very kind of weakly kid, um, eventually gets into why he technically joined, even though he's very weakly. Um, Takizaka, Kaka, 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 Takikazu. 
Uh, more of like the very brash guy that seems like he's more of a, a mean person, but you get more into him. Shugo is like the the swimmer. He's very competitive, uh, very much so a dork, <laughs> dork through and through. Uh, Baba is like literally the heart of the show. He's just like the most tender guy um, kind of in this match of characters. Uh, just a fantastic cast of characters that I really did enjoy getting into and all, like I said, centered around Minato and his his struggles that he faces. So, yeah, I loved it. I love this show a lot. I, I, I think this is like one of the very few sports shows that I just love through and through. Now, I will say... There are points of suspension of, di- uh, suspension of disbelief. <laughs> there is there is one particular point later on. Well, besides like the, the early episode, like you're literally going, he lost literally perfectly this segment of his memories that somehow corresponds with his knowledge of everything water polo. That seems to be a very convenient head bump that he had. <laughs> like like the car was skirting and then somehow he hit his head against the, the, the glass Right there where that segment's at. Just a precision snap. Um, but that even technically gets worse later on in the show when they have another kind of a current similar to that. Where you, again, when it happens, it's like, eh. But you, you just gotta just go along with it. I, I had that feeling of like, eh, okay, whatever. We'll, we'll go on. I know what it, why it's doing it. It's to tell this story. Obviously, to get the concept of him forgetting about what he was so good at. It has to be... I, Granted, technically, I think they could have done like a, maybe a four-year segment, not just the three years of his junior high. But anyways, and it has that moment again later on. But I think if you can kind of let that slide, like, you know, this obviously needs to happen in order to tell the story, it's fine. And it tells a really fantastic story with that. What you lose, what you gain, who was your previous self, who is yourself now, what decisions you make in the future that affect those around you, especially your family and everything. I think the way that did all that stuff was great. It was a... It was a mechanism in order to tell the story, and I think it was a fantastic story with that. Obviously, the people that knew him previously that are really kind of conflicted about the changes that he has, some people that are fine with it, some people that are not so fine with it. And to get into those characters was a great point in the story that I really did love. Now, the things that it does with that later on is hard to get through, I will be perfectly honest. Not because it's bad writing, it's because it's frustrating. And I think it was frustrating for a reason. You don't really want to see this happen to the characters, but it does get into it. And it was actually a lot more darker about that than I thought it was going to be. I was very much so surprised as I got lighter in the series. I'm like, I didn't realize it was going to get this heavy. Not really dark. It's really heavy. Um, Getting that really heavy with it and not being afraid of making you really hate characters. This show doesn't really shy away from the idea that you're probably going to hate this character because of what you really kind of get into in later parts. And the willingness for the writer to really get into that stuff and make it make sense and make it hit a very strong climax and a very strong ending is definitely something that I was very much so surprised by. Um, I also think this is a story that's probably done with this. I think this is probably, it was a a, a clean cut story. There wasn't really any necessar- necess- necessity for a continuation. So if you're looking for a complete story, this definitely has it. Yeah, technically they're probably going to do something in the future, but I think it was a complete told story that I really did love in the end. Um, a lot of really great moments where I felt very much like I was cheering on out loud with the characters and what they were going through. I mean, especially with Joe and his relationship with his father, obviously more so uh, personalized for me. But just having those moments of like, just do this. You could do it. Just do this. Why, why are you waiting? Uh, having those moments in the show really did kind of show me that I was really invested in the characters and I really did enjoy them. So, yeah, it's a fantastic show. I really did love it. Um, probably going to go down as one of my favorite sports shows of all time. Um, but, um, I'd have to look at the list. It's a very small list. <laughs> it's a very small list of sports shows, but again, it's, it's, it's not really, I think most like sports heavy fans were probably like, it's not really a sports shows because none of sports in it. Um, but yeah, this is, this is one of the ones I think I, I don't know if I remember tell Chris to watch it, but it was, it was one that I really liked. So out of curiosity, the, the, the whistling noise, because I'm assuming the whistling noise was coming from this show. Was it like the refs or because it sounded like, you know, the, the whistle firecrackers. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Probably. Probably. Either that or the, the chimes for the periods or something. What do we call it? Uh, the periods, like each segment of, of play. Anyways, that's for main. Check that out if that's interesting to you. Battle game in five seconds or Date Fabio de Battle. 
This one streamed on Crunchyroll. The source, uh, the studio is Synergy SP or Vega Entertainment. The source is a web manga. The genres are action, superpower, supernatural. I think this is twelve episodes. Question mark. Seems I didn't write like down. It. I didn't write down the episodes. Uh, <laughs> so this composition was by Toko Machida, who has again done a lot of stuff. So. Yeah, this one, uh, if I can remember correctly, opens up with this guy named Akira who just thinks the world is boring and likes video games and wants the world to be video games. And then the world becomes video games and he immediately springs in action and impels some dude and then is knocked out unconscious by some crazy cat girl lady and then brought into a room with a bunch of other people that are all very uniquely looking and they're all given special abilities by this company in order to test them out. And they've been removed from the family registry of the government so that everybody doesn't even know they existed. And so now they have to basically learn how to use their each unique abilities to fight each other in different competitions. And um, some suck, like being able to smell emotions. But some are really cool, like being able to blast somebody in half. So, yeah. Your thoughts on Battle Game in five seconds, or your review, rather. <laughs> this one is a, a a really weird one. I I I chop it up to it's it's pretty much just a popcorn action type show, um, mostly because of the fact that while I I the main reason why I got stuck on this show because I I came into it and um, they yes please tell everybody because they're all wondering why you'd like a show where people get blown in half. It w- did not do that the entire t- time, okay? I'm just going <laughs> to throw that out there. This is nowhere okay. near as uh, it. And a guy that likes to smell girls. and That, all, I, that like, was kind of creepy. And kills some poor little girl <laughs> after, you know, our, yeah. It, it starts out, yes, it starts out coming off as very, very dark. It's nowhere edgy. near. It, it's called edgy, Yeah, Chris. I, I guess we can go with edgy. It, the, the, the funny thing about this show is when the, what kind of hooked me in, that being, truth being told and um, being very honest, the, the concept of the powers was really the thing that um, kind of hooked me. Um, the main character, his, his main power is being able to um, use a power that he can convince his opponent that he has. Now they they play that off a little bit His later. Powers, whatever they believe it is. Yeah, it, it, they play that off as just whoever he kind of imposes that feeling on. So I'm I'm not going to go too much more farther into that. It gives him variability with the with the power. So um, it don't get too stuck on the the only the opponent is the only one who can um have that power they 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 kind of break that rule very early in the show of course they have to make it evolve otherwise it wouldn't be interesting now the so take that into consideration as that was the main reason why i was very interested in the show i wanted to see what kinds of things they can do with this and they do do that on occasion um they 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 later on show another character who has something very similar um that is kind of bending the rules of the world in in gives gives it its own unique flair. The problem that I probably have, the biggest problem that I have with this show is that it's almost trying to give the perception that it's a lot more intelligent than it actually is. And that's the frustrating thing. I wanted something that is a big time almost a cat and mouse type thing. And while they do that here and there, it never it never gets to the point of just walking away going, man, I, my mind is blown. That was so brilliant. It just goes to the level of pretty much popcorn action-y type show with a lot of interesting um, abilities. And so that's kind of where I lay with this. It, it is pretty much an interesting show as far as the abilities. I hope that in latter latter episodes they can do something very fascinating, especially since the quote unquote big boss per se, if you want to call that character that, um, is an ultimate end goal, and technically the big boss knows the powers. So how that would all play out would be very interesting to see how that would go. Um, they've gotten to a resolve point where obviously the next chapter is ready to go. Um, they didn't leave much of anything hanging per se, except for the main quest, if you want to call it that. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But as it stands right now, it's just a popcorny action show with some interesting powers. 
Um, so take that for what it is. I never realized it, but obviously the concept of Akira's ability is that it's whatever somebody believes it is. So to give people an example, like when the first episode, um, when they all first arrive in the room and this this cat girl lady's basically telling everybody that you're going to be, you know, basically test subject. Somebody steps up and was kind of obviously uh, confronting her. And so she turns her hand into a cannon, Mega Man, like, you know, Mega, like, like Mega Man, blasts him in half and he dies. So in the first battle that Akira has after learning that his ability is whatever somebody believes it is, he fights this guy and basically says that his ability is what he he basically tells him, you know, remember that Mion lady that basically blasted somebody with a cannon? I have that too. And so obviously the guy's like, oh crap, he has the hand cannon thing. Boom, his power uh, uh, turns into him having a hand cannon. So what happens when somebody knows that his ability is to man- manifest what the other person believes it is? And that's what they believe that his ability is, is to manifest what his ability is. Is it become a complete infinite loop and then the world ends? Like if she believes, if this person believes that his ability is to think whatever his ability is, and then that ability is to think whatever his, her ability is, and that ability believes whatever the ability is, and it creates an infinite loop. And then the world ends. Okay, you're just going way off the... the did the world... Did, did, it actually, I, did I spoil the ending? I... Yep. Yeah, I, exactly. <laughs> so I guess this is probably not an ended show. I'm going to assume it's, this... It's actually... I'm going to assume this show that, is not that, that power was so overpowered, we're actually not even existing right now. It, the, just be, it existing we're, in a in manga and an anime just ended the world. Yeah. It, we're, we're not even talking about it right now. How did this show even come to any kind of semblance of an ending? Did it have anything satisfying to ending it with? Yeah. That's what I was saying. It, it, it wrapped up. N- not the entire uh, the entire thing, but it, it wrapped up in a good solid uh, chapter in. Mm. What a big down on that one. Battle game in five seconds. <laughs> I, well, I, outside of you actually watching it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I had I was gonna get caught up on that one, and then I realized, oh yeah, I could probably watch Tokyo Revengers, which I'm only like twelve episodes in, and so I figured, eh, I'll let Chris do this one. I'll do well, Tokyo at least Revengers. this one you actually seen things happen. Unlike, <laughs> unlike Sunny Boy, unlike Sunny Boy. Anyways, uh, yeah, Sunny Boy is our next one. Streaming on Funimation, ran for twelve episodes. Then by Studio Madhouse, the source is original. The genres are sci-fi, superpower. Uh, this one director was uh, director and writer was Shingo Natsumi, who did Aka 13, Boogie Bot Phantom 2019, Hori Mia, One Punch Man, and Space Dandy. I think directed all those, didn't really write them, but yeah. This one essentially follows a classroom of kids who are essentially transported along with their school into a void. And at some point, they're kind of trying to figure out, okay, well, why are we here? You know, when are we going to go back home? How do we get back home as they're sitting in this cla- this entire school, just not able to do anything? They start realizing that some of them have started manifesting superpowers. So, you know, some people can do different things. And at some point, the student council president decides that they need to have, like, order. You know, they, they can't just sit here and destroy the school with their superpowers. And eventually, we're going to have to go back home. And we don't have to explain all this stuff. So they start, empl- you know, employing rules that they have to follow, which includes not using their abilities. And eventually they find themselves transported from the school to a island. And then the island has weird things about it, like certain weird rules about the world itself that or the island is in. And yeah, so they just they realize at some point they're kind of like in a stasis where they can't really age or die or anything like that. Um, at some point realizing there's other people in this particular world of worlds and there's other worlds that they're not this world and they want to figure out how to transport between each worlds to figure out how to get back to their original world. So yeah, that was a really sucky explanation, but I don't really have anything else to give you. <laughs> I don't really have anything else to give you. Um, yeah, I guess that technically gets to my first issue. I, this is kind of the example that I was given earlier with this idea of having a lot of cards of mystery. And I don't really necessarily think uh, providing them at a good pace I think I went through probably half the show wondering when it's going to start revealing things and not creating questions because this show does really well in creating questions like it, it creates a lot of mystery and eeriness about the world itself like what is going on and you want to know more about the world and what's going on but at some point you're kind of going I need to start you need, you need to start giving me some stuff and granted it, it took about half the series before it started giving me some stuff that I was like okay cool that explains this that's interesting um, but I think it's kind of the if I could give you, I, I I honestly wonder if this director 
literally watched Lost before they made this show. <laughs> um, because it's like Lost. Lost is kind of a similar case where it feels like you're constantly wondering what's... Lost had a really good ability to create questions and then answer a couple of them. But the problem that had Lost had, similar to what I think this has, is that at some point you realize you're not going to answer any of this, are you? Like, you've, you've created a laundry list of questions, and I don't think you're really planning on answering any of it. I don't know necessarily that it's a case of you got too lost in your mystery that at some point you're like, I don't really have any way of explaining any of this. And at some point, it gets to the ending where it's like, okay, it's done. Oh, so you didn't answer any of that. Okay, cool. So you gave me a bunch of questions and didn't really answer any of them. And that's kind of where I f- sit with the shows. I There was several episodes that I really did enjoy the show. Let, let me be perfectly honest. Um, but I think the issue is that a lot of the mystery and questions that it created that I really was hoping for answers for, it never really was there. And I don't know if you can really chop it up as, well, that was symbolism of this. So it obviously can't be explained. Um, I'm sure there's a lot of people that will hyper dive in the series a lot better than I did and get better answers out of it. Um, but for me, it was like one of those aspects at some point I realized this is this is just not, I guess, not going to work for me. I think in the end, this is going to be one of those shows where I'm just not going to get I, I, maybe I'm just not smart enough. Maybe I'm just not going to figure this stuff out. And I don't necessarily think that's really the case, to be honest, because when I was covering the show on a weekly basis on our YouTube channel before they decided to strike my channel for using a screenshot, thank you so much for that. It, I had a lot of people that were in the comments that were literally going, I had no clue what was happening. Thanks for explaining it. And I was like, I'm just trying to figure it out too. It's not that I know that that was the answer to the question. I'm just saying, this is what I got out of it. And maybe I got out of it more than these other people did, but I obviously was figuring something out that a lot of people were figuring out. And I think that's the struggle. Unless you're sitting there and hyper analyzing things like I was doing in order to do videos on them, I don't think most people are probably going to really get much of it. And that really does seem evident when you look at a lot of reviews. A lot of people are kind of like, what? What did I just watch? <laughs> And like I said before, that struggle with realizing at the end of the show, they're not going to answer any of the stuff. And the ending didn't feel like it really explained its ending all that well. So I don't know. It was cool because it was mysterious. It was, it has some great animation pieces. Um, a lot of it I don't think looked very good, honestly. I think like I'd probably say half the show looked really good. Half the show just didn't look good at all. Um, there were certain points where it just looked blurry. But – it was doing some really interesting things. I liked a lot of the characters. Mizuho was great. Um, Hoshi was interesting. Uh, Asakaze was an annoying piece of garbage in the entire series, and I never really got anything out of him. Um, Nozomi was great. Nagara was kind of like a pity party the, most of the entire show, which I guess was technically the point. Mm-hmm. It has some solid characters, um, and it has some interesting mechanics. And the, the the abilities themselves they got in some of them were interesting. Uh, I think Mizuho was probably the most interesting out of all of them with the abilities and stuff. Really getting to her was probably one of the more interesting aspects of the story. But And the reveals that it did do were great. It's just there was too many other questions that never got answered. And like I said, I don't ne- think necessarily think that they were ever planning on answering any of those questions. But um, So yeah, it's a, it's a very much a big mix back for me. I'd probably say about a quarter of the episodes are really great. And the other three quarters, I was just most of the time going, are you ever going to really answer any of this? (laughs) You're just doing a lot of really weird stuff that I'm not really getting. So it's definitely one that's probably many people that are really into symbolisms and trying to figure out the context of the writer would probably really love. So if you're really into artsy fartsy stuff like that, you're probably going to find a lot of stuff to really enjoy here. Just, like I said, I don't know that necessarily you're going to find all the answers. So take that for what it is. I think that was about as kind as I can be with this show. <laughs> so yeah, that's Sunny Boy. Definitely check that out if that's interesting to you. My next life as a villainous all routes lead to Doom X or Otome Game no Hamatsu Flag Shika Nai Aku Yaku Rejo no, Ni Tensei Shite Shimasta uh, X. Streamed on Crunchyroll and for 12 episodes. Done by Studio Silverlink. Stores is a light novel. The genres are comedy, drama, fantasy, romance, school. And for those that aren't familiar, this is the second season of a series that pretty much opened up with a girl being transported into her favorite Otome game where she is the villainess who literally, in most every single route of the original Otome game, ends up dead or exiled. 
And so in the first season, a lot of the focus is her trying to avoid those death flags, as they call them, and basically make everybody happy. And the entire time, stressing over the death flags that, you know, loom every around every corner. And then it goes into the second season. So how'd you like the second season? I really um, did like the way and what this this season did. It's 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 fascinating in in some respects. At first, um, when I when I got through about probably the first half of this 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 season, I was getting really frustrated, um, mostly because I was really unsure what they were honestly doing with this. Um, at at probably around the three quarter mark, I started to 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 go okay. Maybe they're just doing some kind of a strange um, taking almost the the idea of the after story and just turning the entire second season into that. And that's kind of where I was starting to mostly chop it up to, um, because there was a lot of things that for a, for a lack of a better term, they were kind of resolving from the first season um, in in some respects, you were getting kind of. Um, a setup of what uh, Katarina is going into into the future. She's going into um, the the magic department. Um, it was kind of resolving a lot of kind of questions that you have with quote unquote the love interests. Um, so you got kind of almost a backstory be- behind almost. I think every one of them actually was covered in some way, shape, or form. So you got a uh, a background on Giordo, uh, Giordo, Giorgio and um, Keith and and uh, the Black Prince and and the other brother. So each one of the characters were kind of getting some backstory, some um, breakdown of who they are and everything like that. However, what I was not considering is it was also introducing some new cast members, which. No, no big deal. You would get some new cast members obviously being added into the story to explain other characters. So I ought to, I didn't automatically assume these characters were going to be relevant later. What is interesting in what happened in this season was they introduced a second um, Atome game that she is going to be going into into the next seasons. Right? I say next season. They, I, I don't think they've actually movie. announced it yet, huh? Movie, a movie. Okay, that 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 makes sense. Uh, I, I don't, I don't know. It, well, whatever. They're going into another Atome game, and I think that they actually pulled that off pretty well. Um, especially since she's not going to have all of her, um, relevant information that she had in the first season. She's not going to have that going into the future. So. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they play that off. I actually really like the way they did that, getting kind of a re- resolution of all the characters in the first season and an introduction to the new characters into the next season. So it'll be fun to see what they do with all that. I I, I liked it. I, I, I really did. All right. There's my next life as a villainous all route scene Dune X. I kind of fell off at some point. I, I probably want to get back to it eventually, but... Beastar second season. This one is streamed on uh, Netflix. Uh, unfortunately, it took them until I think July before they finally aired it because it was a winter winter release. So it technically falls in the fall category. And I did a video on it, so I figured I'd probably cover it here as well for all of our podcast listeners that, for some reason, don't want to support us on uh, on YouTube. <laughs> studio is orange, obviously, still the same studio as the first season. Uh, genres are slice of life, psychological drama, school, shonen. And for those that don't know, basically the Beastars series follows a world where it's kind of like a human setting and everybody's technically like a human form, but they're all uh, different animal people. So there's a wolf guy, there's a bunny girl, everybody is kind of like, you know, humanoid versions of different animals in this world. There's no humans in the world, it's just different animal people. So there is obviously the herbivores and the carnivores. And that is kind of still an issue within this world. It's a very, uh, you know, a normal, like I said, human setting type of thing. So there's obviously, you know, order in place. But there's still kind of this looming aspect that obviously people that are, you know, meat eaters are kind of seen as a threat to those that are not meat eaters. So obviously a wolf would want to eat a a bunny. So that still aspect is still there. And it is a growing threat within this world. So it's obviously looked down upon for people to do that. So the kind of way that this society has made a way for people to keep this order is they have this thing called the Beastar. 
And a B star is essentially this beacon of hope for everybody. So every now and then a new B star is kind of a sign for the world, which is a a staple, a person that is the shining beacon that will kind of be this this beacon of hope for the idea of keeping this order about, you know, don't eat bunnies. <laughs> Um, so essentially the first season, a lot of that stuff was kind of covered. And eventually as we get into the second season, the new thing they're kind of getting into with the second season itself is that, um, there was this kind of this murder that happened at the very beginning of the first season, um, which they never really got to the resolve of as the second season opens up, they've essentially established this idea of, well, the killer for this one, they call it, I think they call it consuming this consuming that happened, uh, happened, never got reserved, uh, devouring, sorry, that was what they called it, devouring. This devouring that happened was never solved. So if we can, if somebody can figure out who that devourer is, which will then, if they find who did it, will obviously appease the the public as a whole because they'll know who did it, um, they will assign that person to be the B-star. Uh, at the same time, they've lost their current candidate, who is Royce. Um, obviously, Royce kind of disappeared after the end of the first season, and so they need to figure out who's going to be the next candidate. And so they figure that's the best way of figuring out if they can find out who did this, that person will be given that title because obviously they've appeased the uh, the, uh, the worry that's happening in the world because they figured out who was a devourer. So, yeah, a lot of the focus is on Luis uh, Logoshi. Logoshi is a wolf guy. Obviously, he has he's probably one of the worst cases of a lot of that whole aspect of wanting to eat herbivores and stuff because obviously wolves are you know normally seen as being very vicious and very uh uh you know based on their instincts and smells and everything like that so obviously he's a good example there but uh lego she obviously is kind of looking into that whole aspect all the while worrying what happened to royce at the same time royce pretty much goes into the black market as they kind of established in the first season there is this black market where if you are a meat eater you can go to this black market and actually buy meat of other people and it be kind of hidden behind the uh the the darkness of the back alleys and whatnot so royce ends up kind of being pulled into the black market aspect of this world and is trying to essentially i guess through his own measures his own route do the same thing for society that the b-star does but just doing it from a different perspective that he thinks is a better i guess a better route to do that so he's kind of enthralled into that whole thing and that kind of reveals a lot of that aspect in the background. So, yeah. Um, B-Star still ends up being probably one of my favorite series uh, to date. I'm really enjoying I didn't. I did enjoy the second season just as much as I enjoyed the first season. There was some points in the show where uh, the second season that I didn't like was was specifically around Legacy going through this, like, training montage, <laughs> which I... I understood why they did it, but at the same time, it was kind of like, eh, this isn't really that interesting to me. Why would, can we kind of move on? Um, but it, it was definitely for a good purpose, was that whole training montage. But other than that, it was everything else was fantastic. Getting into, obviously, the whole devouring and what was behind that. Uh, getting into, I think everything that Royce did was absolutely fantastic. The stuff that they put him through was like absolute torture, but at the same time was really, really fascinating to get into pretty much him forcing himself to have to really fit into this group that would normally be a threat to him was really, really great. Seeing his development as a character was fantastic. Um, yeah, just the same great stuff you get from Beastars. And I think for most people that are really unfamiliar with the series, the thing that I think I love most about the series or the, 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 the property as a whole is that it, like I said, it's technically telling the story of a very human setting you know, going to school, businesses, all this kind of stuff that you would normally get in a real world. Even even crime and and black markets and stuff like that is technically a thing of this world. Having that setting that you can familiarize yourself with, like you're watching this show, this series, and you're going, yeah, they're just school kids. It's like we were at one point. Yeah, they're just going to jobs just like we do. But then at some time, at some point, realizing on a regular basis, no, this isn't our world. <laughs> like, there is things about this that we just cannot really relate to. But taking those elements and somehow making them make sense in a very human setting, make sense in a very human setting, is what's so intriguing about it. Um, especially in this season, the second season, hitting very heavy on that internal switch that these people have. This concept that somebody who, yes, is 
uh, is somebody that is a meat eater, that is a carnivore that's living in the setting of this, obviously they're having to fight within themselves to not be instinctual, to not attack their friend who is, you know, maybe a, a herbivore. And to have that moment where they show that switch happen, where suddenly they become feral and will act on their instincts, which is technically them. Like, that's literally them. And how they explain that in a sense of this world was really fascinating. To have that switch happen, something very visual will happen, but then they not immediately realize, oh, that's a murderer. No, it's, it's, it's seen from a different angle and how that works out. And to have that play out and the way that they pull that stuff off is always fascinating to me. To see that switch happen and to see how they react to it and how it plays out was great. To see how they, you know, that obviously that fear that somebody would have seeing something very uh, violent happen and that distrust that you have. Or maybe that trust be re-sparked by forgiveness. All those things are really stuff that I just absolutely just eat up with a series. <laughs> I love it. Uh, obviously, again, it, it is CGI. I think that Orange has come a long way with their CGI. I think the way that they actually, um, I guess, make these animal people work is really fantastic. A lot of the animation pieces are great. I think a lot of it has to do with ar the artistic direction they take the series that I think helps it. Uh, a lot of the perspective angles of different shots really portray the emotion of the scenes really well. Um, I especially like this one moment where technically one character becomes blinded and how a CGI company portrays a blinded character is really great. Because obviously, if you're blinded, you can still feel things. And so how the show, a CGI show, is able to portray that sense of blindness, but still having that sense of surrounding and touch, I think was really cool. I, I was actually very impressed with how they portray that scene. Um, yeah, just a lot of really great scenes. I, I especially, I think I mentioned in my video as well, there was this really cool scene that kind of tells a lot about the world that they're in in a more um, a more calmer way is they have this moment where there's essentially this one carnivore who is kind of making mental note of how they don't like the fact that the herbivores in her school will constantly come to them and have them take pictures with them so they can post them on social media. So it's like almost a, a social status thing of like, oh, look at me. I'm standing here in a picture with a carnivore. And it's almost seen as like a thing that will get them a lot of likes and whatever. And she doesn't like that aspect. Like almost like she's being used for the fact that she is this threat to them, I guess, in a sense. And there's at some point where she finally asks one of these, you know, herbivores, hey, can we go out together shopping? And she's like, yeah, sure, let's do it. And so she almost like she reaches out there to kind of make that connection rather than always being this distant. And they go out together. And it was really cool because in that scene, you get the sense of how they each deal with their own issues as they go through shopping. So it's a very simple thing of going shopping, but there's all these different things told throughout each encounter, each encounter that they have while they're going shopping. So it's just through and through a very fleshed out world with so many cool things in it. Like I said, a lot of it doing to do with instincts and the divide between the two statuses that I just find really fascinating. I just love it to death and I want more. I just, every time I finish the season of V-Stars, I just want more. Um, it is it is an absolutely an incredible series that I just love death. So I highly, highly recommend people checking out V-Stars, unfortunately, on Netflix. <laughs> I think most people are probably getting Netflix accounts now, now for Comey Song Can't Communicate, so it's fine. But um, that gives you something to watch while you're waiting for episodes of Comey Song. So there you go. Did you ever get finished the first season? Yeah, I finished the first season. Oh, what, did you watch the second season? No. Oh, I was like, oh, crap. So, <laughs> what's your thoughts? <laughs> no, no Netflix on my, my Roku. You can get Netflix on your Roku. I know. I Netflix keep telling, has Roku. It's already on there. I I, I just got to get you in there to. Well, get then the how did you watch going. the first season? Because well, I, I don't even have an you. account, so you'd have to you'd have to get your account up. So, I watched it with you. Oh, that's right. Well, get an account. <laughs> <laughs> Go get a free account. Uh, My Hero Academia season five. Did you finish this one? No. Gosh, Chris. But you're like what three episodes from the end. <laughs> No, I only got didn't watch three, any of the villain three episode academia. in the yeah. Oh, you missed the villain academia arc then. Uh, this one is streamed on Crunchyroll, Hulu, and Funimation for twenty five episodes. Obviously uh, done by Studio Bone Still, sources of manga, and uh, yeah, I not really too much to get into here because obviously fifth season spoilers. But my overall thoughts, I 
I the the part that technically Chris watched as well, which was mostly the first half of this season, was this kind of mock um, mock battles between different classes, and a lot of it was kind of focused on showing essentially how a lot of these characters have developed their abilities over their training sessions with different um, heroes, because obviously they had these little hero internships with all the heroes. And so a lot of them have evolved their powers a little bit. So I felt it was like very much a let's show how everybody has kind of grown. But also it kind of brought in, what was it, uh, B-Class? Mm-hmm. They brought the B-Class in and they were competing against them. So obviously it's showing a lot of how the B-Class has kind of evolved over time as well. Um, I I had my issues with that whole segment. And that was more mainly focused around the aspect that I felt like a lot of characters were downplayed. Even though they're characters that were very strong before. And what I mean by downplayed is it was almost like a feeling of them showing them downplayed in order to show other characters being really good. And I think we talked about this quite a bit in our first impressions, or maybe it was a, a mid season review of it. Um, why do I have two togas in my outline? I guess it's I guess it's nothing wrong with having two togas in your outline. Mm-hmm. Anyways, <laughs> more togas is fine. <laughs> Sorry, I got extremely distracted. But no, I, I thought it was fine. Um, obviously, towards the later part of that, the big focus was that Deku had a change in his abilities, which I think is a really interesting way that they have pretty much introduced to evolve Deku as a character and to make him just have something that's very special and unique to him as a main character, which I do like. I think the what that with the doors that has opened up for the future is really interesting. And it was a really cool way for them to really dive into individual heroes of the past that have had his ability. Um, so I'm really, I'm really interested to see where that goes. I think the moment that they revealed that, I was like, well, that's a really cool thing that they can eventually evolve into other things. So yeah, I was kind of mixed on the competition itself, but like I said, it, it did introduce some really cool moments. I mean, it, we had a really fantastic Uravity moment, so which is always welcome as well. And like I said, the evolution of what they're doing with Deku is really interesting to me. Obviously, Bakugo's episode with his competition was was excellent. I think that was the thing that sparked me to get caught up when I was very much so behind. Uh, but yeah, Bakugo's episode was was truly fantastic because it kind of... I think Bakugo's episode was probably the most... The biggest jump for a character that we really have had in a long time. Because it showed him... Yes, he's a loud, obnoxious dude. But at the same time, it showed that he's not just an idiot that just thinks about being better than Deku. It showed so many more facets of him as a character and his willingness to work with other people that we'd never really seen before. So I really love all that aspect. So your thoughts on that whole segment? I loved it. Cool. Um, after that, obviously we get into <laughs> uh, the my villain. Ac- no, before then, technically we got in the internship. So here's where things go downhill. So following, I think it was like what episode 100, 101, one of those two episodes, we obviously had the shift in arcs which is where apparently, and it seems like everything points to the fact that they wanted to line things up with a movie, which really does annoy me, that they would shift everything and ruin the storytelling just to get a lot of seats in the movies. Um, or at least, why can't you just hold the dang movie until he gets that part? <laughs> Anyways, they essentially took this entire internment arc, I bear, apparently, and brought it forward to, uh, and and pushed back the My Villain Academia arc or whatever, and completely made Andrew thoroughly confused because granted I don't I I think the internship arc was probably one of the weakest arcs I've ever watched of my hero academia of, of my hero academia but more so the fact that it was confusing because the entire time they're doing this internship with Endeavor there's this constant talk in the background about this liberation army and how it's a huge threat and oh my gosh, the Liberation Army, it's coming. It's coming. This big war is coming. But I didn't know what the hell the Liberation Army was. <laughs> they kept talking about it, but I didn't know what, anything about it. And it was at some point, finally, thankfully, they jumped way back. They, they finally got to the My Villain Academia arc, and then we go way back before all this stuff, and we explain what the Liberation Army is and why it's technically a threat and why everybody's where they're at. So... I, I enjoyed the My Villain Academia arc because obviously we get to know more about Toga. We get to go into twice. Um, obviously, Tomura was a huge part of that arc. So I loved all these stories. It was definitely the point in which the writer, I, I guess, allows his character, the storytelling to get dark. Because obviously, it's it's not a very dark series as a whole because 
heroes can't kill people. So obviously you don't really see much violence. And obviously the heroes want to stop bad things. So they're obviously always there in time. Um, so you never really got, it, it, the series never got dark. But obviously getting into the villains, they don't really care about life as much as the heroes do. So it does get dark. And I think that storytelling in the characters were great. I loved getting into Toga. I think I think Toga could have done, I, I, I kind of feel like Toga could have done, been done better. But I still loved getting into Toga. And seeing her evolution in that particular story part was fantastic. Uh, Twice was surprisingly interesting. I really did like him. I I think I've always been okay with Twice. But there is a sense that he feels like Deadpool. Um, And getting into his character and everything really did evolve him from just being another Deadpool character. Um, There's He's more... He's Deadpool with, like, a lot of heart. Like, he is seriously (laughs) heart-on-shoulders Deadpool. So, and I don't really know much about Deadpool, but just what I know about Deadpool. Uh, but yeah, obviously Tomura is a very, very dark, interesting history with him. So obviously, uh, getting in even to the the the, Nom- the the Nomu and all that kind of stuff was interesting as well. So the the villain Academia arc definitely did kind of bring it back for me. But I yeah, like I said before, I really don't like how they switch things around. I think it, I kind of wish that I took my my initial thoughts was to essentially drop the show at 100 or whatever it was and get into the manga instead. And I kind of at this point after this last, you know, whatever episodes, how many episodes that was, I kind of wish that I did that I did do that because I feel like the last, you know, pretty much the, la- the last core and a half, I think it would have been, uh, were really not that good. And it kind of, I lost a lot of my, like of the series because of it so i kind of wish that i would check the manga just that that way that didn't kind of affect it but hopefully going forward they don't do that stuff again and hopefully it gets back into good stuff because obviously the whole thing with the liberation army is interesting it's a huge threat like it is a massive massive i think they said like a hundred thousand uh people that they have working behind them that are in secrecy like it's going to be a massive threat especially since again they've lost all might the beacon of hope or everything um, it obviously switched to Endeavor, but people don't trust Endeavor, Endeavor as much as they did All Might. So there is a threat here. And I'm really interested to see where that threat comes to. But like I said, I think this last, you know, this last season really did hurt a lot of the storytelling and the flow of the story just by swift, shif- uh, shifting things around. And like I said, I kind of wish that maybe not just to read the manga, but maybe just even, you know, watching it in order after it was finished. But it is what it is. I still liked a lot of the backstory stuff they got into. It did, it did still have some really great moments. Like I said, Deku's evolution is definitely interesting, and I'm interested to see where that goes. I still love Endeavor, and I loved Endeavor's story. Um, loved getting more into the, uh, Shoto's family, which was good as well, but yeah. It is what it is. Hopefully hopefully they, they correct things going forward. But um, yeah, that's Hero Academia Season 5. I'm obviously most people are probably checking it out if they I, I was gonna say check it out if that's interesting to you. I think you're checking it out already if you are, because we're literally post hundred episodes by this point. So that time I got reincarnated as a slime, season two, part two, or Tensei Shitara Slime Data Ken, uh, season two, part two. This one streamed on Crunchyroll and for twelve episodes. Uh, obviously they have a movie announced for I think uh next year. So I think fall maybe, possibly. Uh, studio is 8-bit. The source is a manga. These genres are fantasy, comedy, slice of life, shonen. And for those who aren't familiar with slime, it essentially follows... Oh, I guess... Are we technically getting into stuff where I think we have to soft-spoiler things? It's kind of hard to talk about. I think that's where, where, where we were with the last show, so... <laughs> so, yeah, kind of uh, keep that in mind. Soft-spoilers here as we get into the series. I'm not going to spoil anything huge, but just keep in mind we've got to talk about certain things in order to talk about the season. So, soft-spoilers, if you don't want to hear anything at all about slime, you can jump forward. But yeah, um, yes. Yeah, so for those that are unfamiliar with and that want to know, it essentially follows a guy that's uh, got gets stabbed in the real world, gets these set guy into another world as a slime. Uh, he has the ability to kind of consume things and gain abilities and, and strength from consuming things as a slime. And eventually, he ends up starting to build a nation of people, and at some point has to protect those people, and that leads to him becoming a demon lord. And then going into the season, we essentially have. The meeting of the demon lords. So, Clayman is finally getting his due, possibly, <laughs> as we meet, because Clayman calls it. So they decided to meet up, and uh, yeah, he has to face up against Clayman and his his accusations about all the stuff that Remedy has been doing in the past. So, 
Your thoughts on part two? Um, I loved it. Uh, there was a lot of things that they kind of, um, quote unquote, resolved um, from the first season. Going into this next season, they've they've opened up a lot of different things, um, set up a lot more world building, kind of shifted around um, alliances and everything like that. So I really liked that they did a lot of that stuff. the The conclusion of everything, I think, was really well done, and they did a massive power level test of, of, across the board. Just show. Okay, this is where everybody is pretty much at at the moment. So you get this kind of idea of where every where all of the pieces are per se at the moment, and I think that that was really well done. Um, matter of fact, I I I almost even well, think about level it. showing that Remedy's uh, least powerful minion Shion literally bested <laughs> a demon lord. That's a showing of power that literally Remedy has too much power. <laughs> it, 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 it's one of those things where I, I sat there and, and, and as we were getting ready to, to um, set, uh, talk about this, I was thinking, am I going to say it's anticlimactic or am I going to say, I think this is very, it, it was fascinating the way that they did it. Because in a way, um, while it was very abrupt, a lot more abrupt than I was expecting, I don't think it was a bad thing because I think that they did it well um yeah i guess you could say that just it because rimuru is is too overpowered i don't necessarily think that was the point of what they were doing there it is i I, like i said i think it was a power level test it was just to show you where the pieces are it doesn't necessarily mean that rimuru is so overpowered um i think that it, it, it was allowed to be the way it was just to show hey Yes, overpowered Remu is. Yeah, I don't think he's overpowered. It, it, yeah, he is. You, all right. You can't say that. Come on. I think it just laid out the board so that you can see where everybody was. Um, and it, I, I think it did it well. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm I, it's sad because I think I, I hyped up the meeting way too much for myself because, like, obviously I had to get caught up with the second season. Obviously, I think I also had to watch the, um, the ONAs or whatever they are, OADs, whatever they are. And I'm kind of sad because I obviously getting caught up with everything. I kind of started hyping myself up for the meeting. Well, technically, we went through like five meetings before we got to the meeting of the Demon Lords. <laughs> but I hyped it up so much that I think I I was disappointed because I hyped it up so much. So when it finally got to the meeting, it was fine. But it's like everything that I was kind of hoping would kind of come to a head, like all the cool little things they could have done. I was like, oh, OK, that was it. Uh, oh. Well, I, I guess it's fine. I mean, it had a fun little ending to it, but that I kind of, like I said, I, I, ex, I set my expectations way too hard. I think I found more entertainment out of everything that Shuna and all them were doing and all the reveals they did with that. But it was it was fine in the end. I I don't necessarily I think it's more of a setup for anything for for other things as well, because obviously towards a later part of the entire meeting it was a lot of setup for characters that were surrounding everybody. And a lot of buildup for, like, Diablo and other characters that are constantly being hinted at at a regular basis. Like, literally, Guy brings up Diablo and all them over and over again. It's like, okay, I think you're setting up something here. I guess this is necessarily not about Clayman and everything. It's more about this other stuff that obviously are possibly the future stuff. But, yeah, it was still fine. I still I still loved pretty much every episode of the season. And I'm, I'm one of the few people that I actually liked all the meetings. I think they're... they're they're not going to be for everybody, but like I've said before, technically this writer really loves building nations, and Slime has always been about Isekai build nation, and in order to do that properly, the writer is very focused on making sure that everything involving communication between different nations is done and fleshed out, and so even though, like I said, I yeah, I even joked about the fact that it felt like the entire second season was literally like part one and part two was all meetings to pretty much wrap up what, no, what not technically, it would be later part of part one and into part two was all meetings to basically talk about what happened in the early part of part one. Everybody kind of had to, we had to suss everything out. We had to communicate everything to everybody. And so it turned into episode after episode after episode of meetings. And I do like that because like I said, it, it doesn't, 
discount the, ne 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 the necessity of these nations to communicate and to really see where the cards are going to lay after a very catastrophic thing happens to another nation and how that affects all the other nations. So I was perfectly fine with it and I really did enjoy it. But like I said, my issue probably more laid in, I put a lot of expectations on the meeting of the Demon Lords and it didn't really deliver to my expectations, which is my own fault. So, but I did enjoy it though. I did enjoy a lot of the characters, plus the introduction of a certain vampire was mm -hmm. great. And I'm, I'm already sold on that character, so... <laughs> Yeah, I border on the edge of the meetings was probably a little bit too much. But at the same time, I loved what was in the meetings and that. So I, I know it's a kind of a ironic statement that I'm saying that, but that's where I lean. I, I got a little bit bored with the meetings. Yeah, that's uh that time I got reincarnated as a slime season two, part two. Hopefully you're checking it out already. If you're not already, it's a lot of fun. Uh, Higurashi, when they cry, Satsu, the next one, or Higurashi no Nakokoro ni... Satsu, this one streamed on Funimation, ran for 15 episodes, done by Studio Passione. Uh, source is a visual novel, obviously. The genres are mystery, dementia, horror, psychological, supernatural, thriller. I didn't know that was a genre. Uh, director was Kichiro uh, Kawaguchi, who did Island, Minami K, Nyankoi, Gakko-chan, and Sket Dance. The character designs was obviously done by Akio Watanabe, who did Bakemonogatari series, as well as the Furuka Saya series. Um... Yeah, I can't really talk about this one very well. well I guess I can technically talk about it without spoilers. Uh, if people want my spoiler-filled discussion about this, I did it in my video review of it, which I think I just posted today. So you check it out there. I'm not going to really do full-on spoilers here. Uh, in the end, I honestly, for those that are not familiar with the series, essentially follows a... It takes place in a village in the outskirts of Japan called the Hina, uh, Hina Mizawa Village. And this village has had a history... <laughs> A very dark history where essentially the government was going to dam, put a dam up, which would obviously flood the area. And so the Hina and Mizawa people decided to uprise and riot against the government. It was a murder that was involved in that entire situation. So obviously things were a little bit risky there. The government decided to step out. The dam was not built and it continued forward. Jump forward a little time and we follow a guy named Keichi who has recently moved there with his father and he starts to go into school there. And through Keichi's eyes, basically, we get a perspective of what's happening in the village, mainly from him kind of learning about, yeah, what this incident with this dam and this dam project. And then this mysterious murder that happens every single year, as we find out that apparently every year they have this festival, um, which essentially, um, I forget what the name of the festival was, cotton, the Cotton Festival or something like that. And apparently every night at that festival every single year, somebody is murdered and then somebody disappears. And so everybody chops it up as being just uh, chop it up, chops it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> everybody chops it up as being that, the curse. Say pun was intended or pun was not intended. Not intended, but it was a really good one. <laughs> um, essentially, every year this happens and everybody just kind of chops it up as being the curse. And so but there's always kind of this whisper that. Well, what if it's not a curse, but it's actually somebody just trying to get rid of somebody that's kind of an inconvenience? What if it's a family that is possibly doing it in order to cover up something? That's always kind of the question mark that's in the background as you do get a little bit of sense of this, uh, almost like a paranoia that kind of builds around it. So obviously the other interesting aspect that comes of the Higurashi series, which was present in the original series that was adapted a long time ago, is this aspect of a reset. That every time this tragedy happens on in 1983, everything gets reset to some time period afterward or beforehand, and then things play out again, but slightly different. And you start to see some some sort of similarities in the storytelling as it goes along, and ultimately how that affects certain characters and how they can overcome it in the end. So, with all that said, so the brief idea of what's going on here. Uh, Essentially, for those that aren't familiar, when they got into Higurashi When They Cry, Go and Sutsu, which is the new series that they just recently did, this is both a something for new and old fans. That's how they put it. This is for new and old fans. So if you watch the original Higurashi series, you're going to get something new here. And how it does that is, yes, it plays out the same scenarios we are familiar with with the original series. It does explain a lot of the storytelling and story beats that we got from the original series. But then at some point... It twists it, and things shift into a different direction. Now, 
My only issue that I really have with Higurashi When They Cry, Go and Sotsu, which is technically the fourth and fifth season, is that that different element that is the cause of some issues in the background, I didn't really care for. Like, I didn't really think that it was that... I don't know if it's... I would say that's well told, but I, it's not that it wasn't well told. It's just that I was very frustrated with it early on, and I didn't really feel like it developed in the way that I wanted it to. Even still, accepting it through the eyes that I did, which is technically... The thing that is causing the issues in the background is a result of a a snowball effect. Like, it keeps... It's something that starts from something stupid and simple, but then develops into something bigger and to something that it can't stop itself anymore. And then when I explain it to myself that way, which I think is technically the intention of the story, it makes sense and I'm fine with it. Um, I still feel like the ending was a little bit of a letdown, but it was a an ending that I was happy with in the end. And I think a lot of people kind of echo that same sentiment where it's like one of those endings where you're like, this could have gone in a really cool, interesting way, but we're going to do this instead. I'm fine with it. I'm happy. Characters, certain characters are happy, so I'm, I guess I'm happy with this. Um, it looks fantastic. Um, I think Passione did an excellent job on it. Um, it looked great. Granted, technically, the old series was quite a while back, and it had its own issues with animation, but I think it looks great. I think I really do like Akio Watanabe's artwork. Obviously, there's a little bit of a, a laugh here and there about the fact that they do the head tilt similar to the shaft head tilts because and I probably think it's probably because Akio Watanabe was working on the character designs. <laughs> maybe maybe Akio Watanabe's character designs are designed to hedge tilt. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. But um, yeah, it looks great. It looks great. Um, the directing was top notch. This show was so well directed. Um, props to Kichiro uh, Kawaguchi. Uh, I, I think there was a lot of s- stories in this retelling that were absolutely fantastic. It, it's it's It really does tell you something when you see... The thing that I love so much about the original series, a lot of the things that I loved about it, was the descent into madness aspect. Obviously, there is something that is coming into play with each reset where somebody seems like they go into this downward spiral into paranoia um, and madness. And how they portray, like, especially Rena's story, especially Xion's story in this later part, were so fantastic. And how well it contrasts what certain characters believe will play out was really well done having that element where somebody believes everything's going well and then behind the wall it's not going well at all like it is bloody and it is not going well um i I think that's really a a testament to the directing and the the work that they put into it i like i said i especially love rena's story and it's heartbreaking at the same time It's, it's it sucks whenever you see these characters going in that downward spiral you're loving how it's playing out and how interesting it is. But at the same time, you're going, this sucks so much because I don't want this character to be like this. <laughs> um, it is it is always what I've loved about Higurashi. And it's what I love about the series, too. I, I'm a huge fan of the Higurashi series. And to get more of it was fantastic. Like I said, besides my issues early on with not really liking certain motivations, I still like it in the end. I still love it in the end. I'm still happy in the end. And more Higurashi is always great. Now, for those that are wondering, I recommend people watch the original series first because, like I said, I, I technically would chop this up as Go is Season 4 and Satsu is Season 5. So go watch Higurashi, Kai, and Rei before you watch Go and Satsu. You don't have to. You can jump right into Go and watch Satsu. It's fine. But I think you get more out of certain characters if you watch that original series. Yeah, that was exactly what I was going to ask was if it was really a worthwhile new person starting point. Yeah, it's one of those things like you could you could still understand everything if you start and go, except for like we mentioned that very first scene where it's like, oh, yeah, this is definitely not a, a reboot, um, except for that scene's going to be like, what, what, what's this? What's going on here? Um, it makes sense for people that just come into it. But like I said, you're not going to get like certain characters have been through some major stuff for a long time in this property. And to get a sense of what they've gone through, it's better to start it from the very beginning. And to see that. So, choice is up to you. I know that some people have struggles with older style of animations and stuff. So, I, I don't think the older series look... I think the original first season is pretty rough looking. But I think that same studio ends up in the season two and Kai and Ray and stuff. 
actually looked a lot better. And they definitely polished their animation as it goes along. So, yeah, highly recommend it for me. I love the series to death. Um, there was certain, there was so many good scenes in this season. Um, th- there is definitely some issues with them reusing assets in a way that wasn't clever. Because obviously having a restart over and over again, you're going to have reused scenes. There was like one point where one episode felt like a throwaway because it was so many reused scenes. But for the most part, they do a good job of really kind of mixing things up. The stuff they did with Uncle Hojo blows me away. <laughs> I I am so blown away with what they did with Hojo. Um, Uncle Hojo is just a dirtbag. And to do what they did with him, I'm, I'm you know, I a standing ovation just for that. I don't know how you could possibly pull that off, but they did. So, yeah. So there you go. There's Satsu. My full spoiler thoughts is on my YouTube video. Check that out if, you, if you're interested. But um, that's where I'll leave it for here. So, All right. Our next one is Tokyo Revengers. This one streamed on Crunchyroll. Ran for 24 episodes. Was done by Studio Leiden Films. The source is a manga. The genres are action, supernatural, drama, school, shonen. This one follows a guy named Takamichi. And Takamichi is a young adult. And at some point, he hears on the news that there was this gang violence and... A girl from his high school actually was involved in it and unfortunately passed away. Well, skip forward, he's waiting for a train and suddenly he finds himself pushed in front of the train where he thinks he's obviously going to die. And then for some reason, he zaps back into his childhood body and he's suddenly back in time. (laughs) Back in 2005, about 12 years prior to that event, and he's now back in middle school and back in the time when he was still actually going out with the girl that unfortunately was killed in the gang violence. He doesn't quite know why he's there, but he's kind of going along with it and experiencing his young life again until eventually he runs into the brother of the girl that he was going out with and kind of tells him, you know, look, bad things are going to happen in the future. Please make sure to protect your sister. And to kind of seal the deal, he ends up kind of shaking the brother's hand and zap, he's back in the future again where (laughs) this whole incident actually occurred. But anyways, through this whole ordeal, he actually finds out that the sister is still alive now, and it's all because he told the brother to make sure to protect her in the future, and he did just that. But even still, even though this does occur, uh, things end up transpiring still, and he finds himself having to go back into the past again by shaking the brother's hand. I don't know how they figured out that shaking hands somehow makes him travel time, but it works. And he ends up having to go back in time in order to figure out how he can make this gang in the future stop from essentially leading to the death of the sister. Essentially working along with the brother, who for some reason retains his memories, is able to kind of figure out, okay, well, because this part of the gang is the bad part of the gang, you need to make sure to prevent this from happening so that bad things don't happen in the future. So yeah, my thoughts on this series. I Honestly, I'm of two minds of this series. There's one aspect of the series that I really do like a lot. This is aspect of like a period piece Japan... Uh, gang that is obviously a thing at the time, biker gangs and stuff, and really getting into the, I guess, the birth of that gang and everything, all the characters within it that have to deal with issues that eventually lead up to this larger gang in the future that obviously he needs to figure out how to manipulate enough that it doesn't affect the people that he does love. Because as he quickly finds out in the past... This girl that he kind of parted ways with, that was his girlfriend, Hinata, is somebody that he actually really did care about when he was younger. And to kind of re-spark that love and the desire to protect her obviously leads to something of a strong passion for him to make sure nothing happens in the future. And this is all kind of really enhanced by the fact that the characters are really solid. I loved all the characters in, unfortunately, the gang. I mean, Mikey, Draken, a lot of those characters are really cool characters. And all these great moments with his experience in dealing with them is where a lot of that drama kind of stirs up. Even though it is, you know, how it manages to really portray the fact that these are really nasty people. These are dangerous people. But yet he still has to find the courage within himself that really honestly at the very beginning and technically through most of the series doesn't really exist. (laughs) Is definitely that driving force early on that really pushes the story forward. I mean, a really good example is this moment shortly after he meets Mikey, who's kind of the leader of this gang, comes to meet him at his school, and Hinata ends up kind of striking him, and you have this brief moment of like, whoa, this is not good. This is going to lead to something very terrible. Hinata's in danger. (laughs) And the way that it kind of portrays that stuff is really solid. It's almost like the immovable object that the protagonist really has to push, even though pushing it could lead to his death. 
And like I said, I do believe a lot of these characters have some really deep storytelling that goes about it as it kind of slowly gets into each individual branch of this particular gang, how the gang itself slowly evolves and grows bigger to a point where obviously Takemichi can no longer really control it. And I think it's that sense of the lack of control that really does drive the story forward in the idea that even though he does need to make some sort of effect to stop the gang from growing stronger or growing more corrupt, it's something that he personally often faces he has no control over whatsoever. Now to get into my negatives. <laughs> I I really don't like Takamichi. <laughs> I mean, he's technically very true to the title of the last episode, very true to the title of this opening song. He's a crybaby. He's an absolute crybaby. And if I often feel like he's not really doing anything most of the time. Most of the time of the show, while I'm enjoying the story of the gangs, which I think is the biggest drawing point for me, is the aspect of the gangs. I also do like the aspect of trying to save the girl, but a lot of my driving force is really in the gang itself, which I really do like. The Tokyo Manja game, by the way, um, <laughs> which we'll get into later. But yeah, yeah <laughs> this was the driving force was the gang. And sadly, most of the show, it's just really the gang information, which I do really like to watch. And technically, Takemichi's introduction into the gang and all the crap that unfolds but most of the time when it focuses on Takamichi, he's just standing, standing there whining. He just whines the whole time about nothing that he can do. And he cries and whines and whines. And he doesn't really get anything done. I think really it turns into one of those things where all the interaction that he has and all the changes that he makes is because he cries and people see it. Which again, I guess technically is the point. But at the same time, it's kind of frustrating. It's like, why don't you do something? Please do something. Again, I do understand his fears. He's dealing with a lot of people that will harm him or possibly kill him. But if you're the main protagonist, please at least at some point do something. <laughs> and that's that frustrating that push that frustration that pushes me. Additionally, the time travel stuff, I I I don't know. I'm so mixed on it. I at times I do like it, but other times it's like I have to just really force myself to suspend my disbelief because it's so awkward how it plays out. It's so uh, it, it, it plays heavy on the idea that if something changes, it, it should do more of a rippling effect in the future, but it doesn't. Like, you can have several times where he gets more and more involved with the gang, but it always leads to him working at the same stupid shop. And it's like, I don't care how much, uh, how little changed, something has to change in the future. <laughs> I guess it kind of plays off the idea that once he goes back to the future, like, his autopilot self goes back to normal before the change, but... You'd, you would assume that a lot of things possibly change in that time frame. So, again, it does require a lot of suspension of disbelief, but it is frustrating. Additionally, the big gigantic elephant in the room is the censorship. And yes, granted, most people can probably go out and find Sailing the Seven Seas. They will find the, <laughs> the uncensored version. But I do have to admit that I was extremely... Not so much that I hated... The idea, well, I did hate the idea that they were basically censoring the manji symbol, which, by the way, the manji symbol is a part of their symbol for their gang. It's the Tokyo manji gang. And so the manji symbol is there. The problem is that they felt like this manji symbol was the same as a swastika, and it's not. They're two different things, but for some reason they felt like they had to censor this, which is technically a symbol, a long-running symbol far before the events of World War II, but yet for some reason they felt like they needed to censor that because of it. And that was absolutely disrespectful to the sign itself, but at the same time ridiculous that it had to be, rather than explaining it maybe in a maybe a card at the beginning of the episode. But even worse than that is that the censorship itself was horrific. It was literally, uh, we had several episodes where all we were looking at was a side of buildings because it didn't want to show the scene of the characters because the symbol was on our jackets. And it was it was terrible. It was absolutely some of the worst censorship I've ever seen. Uh, they didn't even want to put effort into it to maybe just draw over it or something or maybe just crop the screen a little bit. I would have even taken censorship bars. <laughs> but to completely spend, like, majority of episodes looking at the side of buildings was absolutely ridiculous. And I absolutely hate that about this show. Additionally, it's very important to note that this series does not have an end, and it leaves on an incredibly nasty cliffhanger. I mean, we're talking Eden Deities levels of cliffhanger at the end of it. 
Um, there's a lot of talk of this possibly getting a sequel. I hope that does become the case because at this point I'm technically invested in it. I want to see Hina to be happy. <laughs> And I think that's a good sign. It's, it's a good sign when you see a lot of great characters, you want to learn more about them, and it does drive you to want more of the series. I think with the aspect of the censorship, I almost want to just say, just read the manga and just completely avoid the series, but I still like it in animated format. It still has a lot of passion and a lot of, a lot of emotion. A lot of the adaptation was really well done besides the censorship, so it's hard for me to really say that the adaptation isn't a good thing, but at any rate, it's a fun journey. I really enjoy it. Like I said, I really love the insights into this gang. I really love the Tokyo Manji gang and the slow evolution of it. Um, I really do like gang stories. Um, like I said, just have my issues with Takamichi. A lot of the time aspects takes a lot of suspension of disbelief. But in the end, I really do enjoy it. And I hope there's more. I'm looking forward to a second season if it does get announced. But uh, yeah, that's my thoughts on Tokyo Revengers. That's that's it for the the finales of, of all the the reviews that we have for the summer 2021 anime season. Um, to give some quick thoughts of the still running series, the Great Jahi will not be defeated. Um, I haven't gotten too far. I think I'm like four or five episodes in, but I I'm liking it so far. Uh, basically, demon uh, second in command demon lord that is loses all of her powers because the magical girl came in and destroyed everything. And so she wants to rebuild the demon realm by gaining all these fragments of this stone that she had that gave her power. And she's a lolly character that can transform into a human form every now and then if she has enough power. And so she has to work as a bartender and try to find stones. And it's it's ridiculous. I do I do really enjoy it. I think the Seiyu for Jahi is the one that's really kind of pulling this off. Uh, the Delusions of Grandeur is always fantastic from her. And yeah, the, the meeting of the magical girl was weird. She's like barged into her home <laughs> and, this, and this, it, the landlady has to call the cops on her. One of the things that I absolutely love on this show is the fact that they they pull off this kind of dichotomy between Jahi just being so full of herself and then being blown away that humanity is really not as much of an enemy as she wants them to be. So I, I really lo- love the way that they pulled that off. Yeah, this is what's what surprises me is the heart. Like every now and then, like suddenly it's like, man, that was really heartwarming. Yeah. <laughs> like, like when she gets sick and and the landlady and the store manager comes in there and takes care of her, it's like really super sweet. And like I said, having the landlady come in and technically protect her from the magical girl was like, I like this. This is so good. It's so cute. So yeah, it's it's really great. I've had times where it feels like it drags on a little bit too much with the jokes, but other than that, it's been it's been fantastic. So I'm enjoying it. The Aquatope on White Stand, please go watch this show. Yeah. <laughs> go watch this show. Are you fully caught up? Yeah. You got so you got the the jump? Yeah. Yeah, it is it is too good. I am I I've I've had my issues here recently with PA works um and their titles. I, I think especially it was mainly around Sakura Quest. I didn't really I wasn't too sold on Sakura Quest. It wasn't that it was bad, it just it wasn't really selling me. Um but so to get this kind of reboot back into what I love about PA works and their writing is is phenomenal as for those that don't know it's basically follows a girl who's like a she basically walks out on the idol industry and then by some happenstance she ends up finding herself in some out in the sticks nowhere not really out of the nowhere but this this aquarium that's out in the middle of nowhere <laughs> that's basically a failing qu- aquarium ends up meeting this girl who is the active director of the aquarium who's trying to keep the aquarium alive and so because she just left her dreams behind she decides to help this girl with her dreams of making sure the aquarium doesn't fail and it's been it's been absolutely a, an emotional roller coaster for me. <laughs> like this show's making me cry so much. <laughs> like every time they have like some old man crying because he sees his brother in his vision and then and having like yeah, Kukuru and her striving to save the aquarium and Oh, Kukuru has been absolutely brutal for me. <laughs> just, just knowing how much she wants this to succeed and she's she is absolutely over and over and over again being blocked and it just oh yeah yeah everything everything it's like it's it's a very emotional show for me and it's it's hitting me on so many levels and like i said going into the second core i kind of um i was hoping for and imagining that it was going to go in the direction it was going and i'm happy to see it's kind of going that direction um i'm really kind of curious as to what's going to happen going from here because there's obviously assumptions that I have with what the original goal of the story was to do. And now I don't even know if it's doing that anymore. Now I'm just curious if the writer's just going a completely different direction with the characters 
And I think that unknown that I'm having right now is really driving me forward. I want to know what happens to these characters going forward. I'm invested in them. And I haven't really had this investment in a PA Works title since probably Shirabako. And it was about the same point in which it really did start. Now, granted, Shirabako took me a little, little bit longer to get into. I got way into this show way earlier than Shirabako. But I'm having the same feeling halfway through the show that I did with Shirabako where I'm like, I just want to know where these characters are going, and I want them to be happy. What is going to happen with these characters? And I think that's a true testament to a series, and I just cannot wait for more. So highly suggest people to check out Aquatopa and White Sand. It's, it's, it's fantastic so far. So great characters, though. So I think that's it. That's it. That's all of our shows. That's it for summer 2021 anime season. If your show was not in here, I'm sorry. Maybe later. <laughs> Maybe we will later. We'll come back to it. I don't know. But I hope you guys enjoyed these reviews of the summer 2021 anime season. Definitely stick with us as we get into the fall season. Start doing our first impressions. And, well, it's going to be a while because it's like certain shows just literally started their first episode. (laughs) We had like quite a gap between seasons. And I'm personally fine with it because obviously I have to wrap up old season, start up a new season. But, yeah, I I think it's going to be quite a while before we get around to doing our first impressions and music and all that kind of stuff. But... That leads us to do some other stuff, so we hope you guys will stick around for that. And uh, as always, we hope you guys enjoyed all of our reviews. As always, we definitely appreciate everybody that does support us through Patreon uh, to give them a shout-out, like I keep forgetting to do. Seismic Wolf, Jason Marsh, Mark Tyler, uh, Adrian uh, DeWalke, uh, Sakumbi, Theodore Moldgren, uh, Sergio Arlasso, Fer- Ferro uh, Saito, Yari, Ben O'Driscoll, Havoc, uh, Toshi, Cesar Salas, uh, CM0, John Bear, Jekyll Geek, QB, Edward Hernandez, Rodney Forhan, Kevin uh, Nauta, Hector Amaya Jr., uh, Otaku 12034, uh, Smash, uh, Smackatosh, Jay Z Meister, and Dave B. Definitely appreciate everybody that supports us on Patreon. And anybody else that considers doing that as well, or is just kind of letting other people know about us, sharing our stuff, getting onto YouTube and subscribing to us there and checking out the videos. Every way that you guys do, we definitely appreciate it. And as always, we thank you all for listening. Hope that you all enjoyed, and you all take care. Oh,